Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 National Coding Symposium 3.0. My name is Jeff Schwartz, and I am the Director of Regional Training and Outreach for the American Printing House for the Blind. I have the distinct privilege of hosting this year's three-day event, and I couldn't be more excited to be here with all of you today. I would also like to introduce, at this time, my co-host and partner in this fantastic journey, Leslie Wallbacker. Hello, I'm Leslie Weilbacher. I am the Outreach Specialist for the Northwest Region with APH, and I'm super excited to be here. I've been a TVI o and m and I'm not a coder, but I've always been fascinated by coding and love learning alongside my students when they were uh, experimenting with, with uh, learning about coding. And we're going to launch our usual polls. So we'll get that up there. This is a uh, who is with us today. We always like to know uh, who you are, where in the country you are, and what your role is. So we'll leave that up for just a minute or two. Okay. Well, so my partner Leslie here is rather modest, and um, I have to just acknowledge that without her dedication and hard work for this event, um, it just wouldn't have been possible. Um, it takes a village, and she certainly was the master of the village at the time. Um, I do feel a little bit guilty because I think when I first approached Leslie, I uh, mentioned um, nominating her as the vice president of coding symposium, which she quickly accepted. Um, and More fool me. <laughs> and I'm like, I suppose sometimes the title does work good enough, but um, it also might also help that the fact that she works for me. So I, I'm not sure which <laughs> one, but I'll let you all decide what, which, which would I strong down her or whether she just willingly jumped in the pool with me. So, um, <laughs> but I wanted to extend my sincere gratitude to you, Leslie, for all of the work that you've done to pull this event together. Um, so the 2023 National Coding Symposium is returning for its third year um, with more opportunities to engage students of all levels of, and all levels of coders. Um, we have moved our event from the spring where it typically has occurred to December to align with the Computer Science Education Week. Um, this event, which is the largest learning event in history, um, focuses on the goal of getting K-12 students interested in computer coding. So we have an exciting lineup for you today and also over the course of the next three days. Um, now that all of us, <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm like, I'm saying three, three, three a lot. So I'm wondering um, how that happened, if it was a coincidence or um, this year happens to be our third year of coding, but um, I'll let you all figure out whether, but anyhow, it is a coding symposium 3.0 for this year. So what do you think, Leslie? Do you think that was just a happy coincidence or do you think that was numbers speaking to us? Oh, well, you know, codes, numbers ciphers <laughs> it was just all in our brains and it just yeah, came out. yeah there was a lot of numbers flying around at our on our side so i'm going to go ahead at this point we have about 64 percent of our audience that has um responded to our poll so i'm going to go ahead and end that at this time and i'm going to go ahead and review some of what's going on here so who is with us today we have 59 percent of our participant participants reporting to be students uh teachers of students with visual impairments um, we have 15% of, um, of our audience are orientation mobility specialists. We have another 15% another of vision rehabilitation and specialists or therapists. And we have about 19% of our audience identifying as assistive technology specialists. So welcome to all of you. In addition to that, we have some parents in our audience. So welcome and we're very excited to have you joining us today. We also have a number of paraprofessionals and several individuals who have reporting as others. So if you happen to be in one of those other categories, feel free to drop what your role is in the chat because we would love to know some of, more about what our audience is he here for. Um, when we're looking at where our audience is joining us from, we have about uh, the largest group or about its height is our Northwest and Midwest folks. Woo, Northwest! 19% of our audience making up and the Southeast right behind at 15%. And the, actually our smallest audience, which is uh, surprising to me is our Northeast, but maybe they just didn't have a chance to respond to the poll yet. So additionally, we'd like to give a shout out to our folks joining us from the US territories. So I hope um, I have some of my folks from Puerto Rico in our audience today. We also have some folks joining us from Canada and a few others that stated others. So if you're joining us from um, a country or a place that's not listed on here, please feel free to drop that in the chat as well. 
Um, the final question that we asked was, how did you hear about this webinar? And the majority of you, like most of the time, heard from about this through our emails from APH. Um, the second largest group was actually from friends or colleagues. So thank you to all of our friends and colleagues who were sharing the Spreading messaging, the getting the word out. Yes. Um, and then followed by our APH website and um, the ACVREP website. So I'm glad to hear all of that. Um, and there was a few of you that said other. So um, again, if you have something to add to messaging, if you want to tell us who that what that other is, be happy to hear about that. Um, so we've had some changes this year. Um, we've made some significant changes to the symposium this year, um, besides moving it to December. Um, we've taken this year's opportunity to focus on coders of all abilities, and meaning we're, we're really wanting to include those who may never have even thought about coding as an option in their lives. So our hope is to spark interest and engagement for students and paraprofessionals, or I'm sorry, professionals with a goal of demonstrating that coding can be fun, engaging, and can be accessible for everyone and every type of learner. Um, one of the many ways we're hoping to engage a broader audience this year is by also offering real-time captioning in both English and Spanish. So if you're wanting captioning for today's event in Spanish, we're going to provide you a link in the chat that you will be able to connect to and you can get um, the coding of this will be captioned in Spanish real time. And I just dropped that in the chat for everyone who might be needing that. So again, I want to welcome everyone to day one of the 2023 National Coding Symposium 3.0. Today, our focus is on student instruction. So, but, but before we get started, I would like to welcome my colleague, who I hope is in here now. Yes, Amy's here. Okay. Um, Amy Campbell, who is our Director of our Learning Management System, or otherwise known as the Hive, who is going to be providing us with some instructions on the use of our APH Hive Discussion Board, which we'll be using throughout today and for the next two days of our event. Um, one of the exciting features of using these dis discussion boards is to allow our community to connect and to continue the conversation throughout the year around coding and actually beyond because it'll be stored there for as long as, 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 long as we're around. So um, I'm going to welcome, here's Amy to walk us through the process of using our discussion boards. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff and Leslie. I am excited to be here and get to say hello to everyone. As Jeff mentioned, I want to just guide you through some steps of how you can access the discussion boards that are that have been uh, mentioned. So I'm going to go ahead and get ready to share my screen. It's easier if I have something to look to as I walk you through the process. So. The APH Hive is APH's learning management system. It's our platform of being, bringing professional learning to uh, homes and also offices. So whether you're a vision educator, perhaps you are a parent, a, co a caregiver, this could be a place that really helps to meet your needs and helps to equip you to better serve uh, students with visual impairments. So the very first thing is in the chat. I'm going to put in the URL. So when you want to get to the APH Hive, you're going to put in www.aphhive.org. And the landing site you get to is what I am screen sharing. It is our APH Hive homepage where we have, um, you can see that we go to course catalog. There's also in the center, an icon for the APH Hive, and then on the right side, professional communities, which is our resources. So whether you want courses or resources, this is where you go to in the beginning. What you first need to do is if you are an existing Hive user, you want to sign in. If this is the very first time you've ever been to the Hive, if you go and click the sign in, you will be led to a way of creating a username and a password. This is something that is totally free. It does not cost a thing. You just need an email address and you put in a password. And this is for those vision educators and caregivers. If you are a student, perhaps you just wanna sit back, relax, just listen. These are for the, those older individuals that are working with you. You can sign into the discussion board. So I am going to sign in to the discussion board. And once I do that, I am going to have access to my dashboard. 
So I'm back on the home page. I am signed in and where I'm going to want to go is on the right side of our homepage is our portal called Professional Communities. This is our repository of resources. So I clicked on Professional Communities and here we have a, an, an array of different professional communities that you can dive into. But what we are talking about for the sake of the National Coding Symposium Week is a professional community called accessible coding and it is the first community that you can even access on this page this is going to take you to an archive of accessible coding resources activities lesson plans for professionals family students of all abilities and levels so i'm going to go ahead and click on the view resources this is now taking me, it's imagining you're opening a door, entering the room of accessible coding, and now we are inside the room. When we are inside of the room, as it mentioned, there are lots of resources that you can't, that have already been loaded, that you can click on. So things like blogs and websites, different training videos, uh, webinars uh, that have already been produced, and an array of products. But where we are going to spend our time is in the discussion board. So I'm going to click on the Professional Community Accessible Coding Discussion Board. And it's going to take me directly into this discussion board. So what we have at the top is a topic of the accessible coding. And already, we have an area called areas of need. So here's a question for you that at one of our co-hosts, Leslie had put in there. And so she puts uh, in there, help out our community. Let us know what resources you need. Share the resources you may have. Some topics might include um, specific programming languages, uh, robotics, math, adaptations for students with complex needs, lesson plans. This is just a starting point to get the conversation moving. And when you want to go in and reply to this thread, put in your ideas or ask your questions, you're going to go into that question, that, that post that she already made, and you're going to hit reply, which then allows you, pops up a, a window where you can ask your question and submit. So we just look forward to this area populating throughout our time together today. And let us know if there's any questions about accessing it. Uh, if you have any difficulties, I'll remain on here uh, just to troubleshoot if there's any if there's any need for that, uh, but look forward to all the conversation that's going to pop in and the resources. Thank you, Amy. And I will just add that uh, we have some loaded in, but we have another stack of things we still need to load and share what you have. And we, we can um, look through those and add them as well. Well, thank you, Leslie, for that little bit of information. I know we were having things coming in as recently as the um, this Last morning. Night. So yeah, so I was going <laughs> to say. So thank you to folks who have seen our call out for um, additional resources, and we that's one of the reasons we're really excited to have this opportunity to work with the Hive. And I wanted to thank Amy and her team for all of the work they did to put together um, the professional learning community and the discussion boards to allow us this opportunity to share and connect and thrive in our community. So thank you again. Amy and the Hive staff for their health assistance. Okay, so well now I think we're ready to get things started for real. So with today's focus being on student instruction, it, it really seemed to me that there was no better way, or to the group of us, that there would be no better way to um, really kick this off than to involve the, in the coding some events to involve students. So for today, our keynote speakers, we have decided to have a couple of student speakers, not just one, but two. And so I'm going to turn this over to Leslie to do our introduction and we'll get started. Well, I had the distinct pleasure of having one of our keynote students, uh, Arushi, as my intern this last summer. And our other one, Emma Grace, uh, met our colleague Adrian at the National Braille Challenge. So we have uh, some very tenacious and up and coming uh, young, uh, people to to lead us off and get us moving, and I will let them 
introduce themselves. So take it away. Hi, um, and good morning. My name is Arushi Mittal, and I'm 17 years old. I'm a senior in high school, and um, I immigrated to the United States with my parents when I was younger, and I've been living here in Bellevue, Washington, which is in the Seattle area um, ever since. My favorite hobbies are reading, listening to music, baking, and staying up to date on current events. And my favorite subjects in school to learn about or even outside of school are math, computer science, and politics. Good morning, my name is Emma Grace Olick. I'm 15 years old and a sophomore in high school. Uh, my hobbies include reading, especially uh, fantasy and historical fiction books, writing, and doing sports such as goalball and tandem biking. My favorite uh, subjects in school include math, history, and chemistry. Um, so how did you get into coding, Arushi? So for me, it all started in middle school. Um, at that point in time, I was having a lot of challenges with learning a screen reader. I was mostly a Braille user, and I didn't have the resources to be able to learn computer skills or code or um, to learn a screen reader. And so when I had the decision of choosing what elective I wanted to take in eighth grade, I decided to um, you know, step out of my comfort zone and take coding in Python 1. Um, at that point, I'd always taken art electives because I didn't have um, access to computer like technology as much. Um, but over that first semester, I practiced a lot and I became more acquainted with JAWS and with, um, with other forms of assistive technology. And then in Python, when I started that class, it was definitely very challenging. Um, there were a lot of accessibility barriers, but I also really enjoyed that class, and that was the first coding class I ever took, but I had a lot of fun with it. I always put a lot of extra effort into all the projects I did, and since then, I kind of knew that I wanted to continue on that journey. What about you? Um, I've always sort of been interested in STEM fields, and so learning code was a goal of mine for a while. Um, last year, um, a local college here in San Antonio reached out and uh, they asked for students who would be willing to participate in a project to learn how to use Python and then use that knowledge to beta test a new screen reader that would make coding more accessible. And so I said that I would be willing to participate in the program and that's how I started learning code. Um, as I learned like more of it during through this class, it, you know, really fascinating to me. And so I've used that knowledge to expand um, my overall use of code. And um, I've also started learning other codes besides Python, like CSS. That's amazing. Um, what kind of challenges did you face while you were like on your coding journey? Um, I guess for me, um, I know a lot of coders use a refreshable Braille display when they code, but I personally prefer not to. And so one of my challenges, especially with Python, is debugging, um, mostly because of indentation, because, you know, Python is very specific um, when it comes to indentation and other formatting. And so I've had problems with that. And, you know, just being able to view code, all of it at the same time, because, you know, like when you're visually impaired, you can't see the entire computer screen with code, you can only read like line by line most of the time. Um, how about you? Yeah, so I've had a lot of the same challenges in terms of indentation and kind of a lot of these formatting things, formatting issues and challenges with debugging because of just how visual it can be sometimes. Um, and I've also kind of experienced a lot of challenges with inaccessible websites. The website that was used during the coding class was completely inaccessible. So that made it very difficult for me to access all of my assignments or really the console or just any place where you write code. Um, and so I sat down with the website developers and the product managers and actually I talked to them about like the challenges that I encountered and how they could improve that. And then um, I was very happy to see the feedback was how well the feedback was received. It felt like they were, you know, they were really trying to improve and make sure that it was accessible and inclusive for everyone. 
And I also have faced a lot of the same challenges as you have with like reading code because it's such a, it can be such a um, difficult process when you can only read one line at a time. And so I primarily use a screen reader to read all the code, but I'm hopeful that with the APH Monarch actually that it's a lot easier to read code because it's a multi-line braille display and because it does um, represent formatting very nicely. Oh yes, I think the Monarch is going to be huge in um, how coding is done for VI people. And that's um, wonderful to hear that, you know, um, about the different problems that you faced and things. Um, when you say that you've learned a lot from them? Yes, I would say that I've taken away a lot of good lessons from coding. One of the first would definitely be problem solving, you know, in coding, there is always a challenge that you're trying to solve, um, no matter how big or small, and there are always steps that you take to um, solve it. You have to communicate with other people about your code. You have to make sure that you know you find the most efficient solution because there's always more than there's always more than one way to solve a problem. But you're just trying to find the best one, and I feel like that mirrors a lot of situations in real life. And also just like resilience, because I was met with a lot of challenges when I started coding and that continued when I took AP Computer Science and with getting accommodation specifically for the AP Computer Science test. But I'd say that it taught me that really, regardless of the number of challenges or barriers that can be thrown at you, that if you're really determined that you can find your passion and make that, um, make sure that you achieve your goals. What kind of takeaways did you have? Um, I had the same ones as you. And um, um, I think that, you know, you learn a lot of creativity from facing the problems that um, you sometimes come across in coding because you have to learn how to solve these problems differently uh, when you're visually impaired because you sometimes the resources that um, sighted people use aren't accessible to you. And so, you know, you solve problems differently. Um, and I think that really just enhances creativity and problem solving skills. And you also learn like a lot of patience from it, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that. Definitely with patience too. Um, so how do you anticipate using coding, you know, in your future? Um, I am planning to study astrophysics or astrochemistry when I go to college. And so I know it's not um, directly involved with coding, but I feel like more and more STEM fields today need coding um, to use it. It's an integral part of the jobs that um, are in those fields. And so I think it's going to be very helpful that I know how to code. How about you? Yes, so for me, I'm currently a senior and so I'm actually applying to colleges right now. And I'm planning on majoring in computer science. And I really hope to take this knowledge of coding from what I've gotten in high school, what I've gotten in college, and just in my personal experience, and really apply that to creating either like a new app or website or software that improves accessibility or that helps with accessibility, or improving an already existing app or website um, to make it more accessible. And really why I see this as important is because I've been met with a lot of challenges, and I know that many other visually impaired people have also had a lot of these challenges, especially in education. And so I look forward to making the world more accessible. And so, um, you know, everyone is able to achieve their full potential and be met with less of these challenges in the future so that future generations of visually impaired people can more easily learn how to code and how to, um, how to participate in computer science fields or really any fields that require um, STEM because that's, you know, I think that having a multi, um, like having multiple perspectives is really good and important for making our society a lot more inclusive and making sure that it's built for everyone. Yes, I definitely agree. And, you know, I feel like STEM careers are so much more open to us now than they have ever been before, especially with, you know, all this new technology and um, so many different role models that you can look up to in the STEM field. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I'd say that the world has definitely grown and opportunities have grown for us too. And I'd say that 
I'm excited to see um, what we can do going forwards because right now, you know, I see it as an open door of opportunities of like possibilities that we have for all the various fields and all the ways we can improve accessibility for everyone. Mm -hmm, definitely. All right, well, we did it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you certainly did. Uh, I loved that you, the perseverance, the multiple ways to solve a problem, the the open door to new STEM fields. That was wonderful, both of you. And I totally did not coach them to bring up the monarch. Um, Arushi was one of my interns, like I said, and I got early feedback from her. <laughs> oh, thank you both very much. Anyone who doubts that our future is in danger, I, I see uh, brightness only going on here. <laughs> I'm a little bit blown away and lost for words at how wonderful these two young speakers are. It's hard to believe that they're just entering adulthood at this time. So thank you both for taking the time to share a little bit of your experience and giving us a little glimpse into your life and how things are going to be moving forward for our, our future for our young folks moving into the field of coding and other STEM careers. So thank you both very, very much for being here today. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, yes, course. thank you. It was our pleasure. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Can't wait to see where you go. Absolutely. Wow. They blew my mind a little bit. <laughs> I feel a little guilty. I got to be my rusty hands on coding. So anyhow, well, so next up, so one of the changes we have made, so originally when the coding symposium was, I think of originally in its uh, beginning stages, um, fortunately, unfortunately, we were in the midst of a pandemic that we won't go too far into, but um, the initial thought was for this event to be live, and there has been a desire to try to move towards that. Um, but there, at this point, we're kind of looking at more of a hybrid model. So one of the reasons that we had postponed to Computer Science Week was to allow us an opportunity to kind of dabble with this idea of day of codes um, around the country. And so we actually had the opportunity throughout this past year to engage students across the country. Um, the first two sites that we were able to engage for this year um, were at the California School for the Blind for a day of code. And we also had a day of code that we sponsored at the Washington Talking Book Library, Talking Book and Braille Library. And so with us today is our very own Leslie. And we also have Adrian here from the California School for the Blind who are going to share a little bit about those two events where they actually had the opportunity to engage students live and in person out when a, with a wonderful day of coding. So I'm gonna turn it over to our two guest speakers for now. Thank you. Go ahead, Adrian. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect, thank you, Jeff. Uh, this is Adrian Amandi at the California School for the Blind. I'm a teacher of the visually impaired and an AT specialist, but also the director of our educational outreach services. Um, we have been very grateful for the past few years to help co-found and organize the National Coding Symposium. Uh, today, right now, uh, we have over 60 students on campus and a myriad of, of programming opportunities uh, called Day of Code 2023. I know that there are TVIs out there and students engaging in Day of Code lessons today as well. Uh, and that is very exciting, as Jeff said, to move from a virtual programming uh, to something hands-on to kick off Computer Science Education Week. Uh, like Arushi and Emma Grace shared, uh, we are, we're moving through this open door of accessibility to this more level playing field where our blind and low vision students can use uh, technology, whether it's programming or just other types of tech. Uh, to gain access to not only their schoolwork, but exciting leisure opportunities and who knows what jobs and opportunities in the future. So I could tell you all about the password security setup and the curiosity setting or protein synthesis. There's a code of friend workshop and, um, a, and a session right now going on called tag your what. Um, but I think the best and easiest way to share a little bit about the day of code at our school will be to show a video. This is actually our second run in California at the Day of Code. We managed to pull this off as well in May of last school year, and we compi compiled a video to share during this time. The one thing I will say to all parents, students, and teachers out there, our Day of Code activities available at the California School for the Blind Computer Science uh, webpage 
are fully accessible to all students we serve. We have both plugged and unplugged activities, and truly anyone can participate. 100% of our student body, uh, from our academic students to our life skills classrooms, are participating today, learning concepts, vocabulary, and programming um, at, at low and high detailed levels. So, Leslie, do you have the video to queue up? I have it ready if I have screen share, but if you have it. Why don't you? Because I think you have the most recent copy. I have it. It's from our web page, and I'm going to optimize our video clip and share sound. And here we go. Scenic view of a grassy mountain in the background. Various campus buildings, CSB students can be seen talking and laughing together. Day of Code 2023, California School for the Blind. We put together the Day of Code associated with the National Coding Symposium. Uh, this is the third iteration of the National Coding Symposium. We have ran it the last two years. Uh, both of them were entirely virtual with attempts to get more hands-on code training for students. We've been doing a lot of activities focusing on foundational principles of computer science. So like logic and algorithms and knowing what code is and knowing what a program is and knowing like about explicit instructions to make an algorithm or your program goes haywire. Uh, so we made a total of 12 lesson plans for this day, uh, both plugged and unplugged activities for students um, of all ranges and ages. Uh, to be able to, to participate. So um, there was coding with Legos, uh, now that the, the APH Braille Lego set is out. So we have Braille Legos that have like different Braille letters. And the Braille dots on the Legos are bigger. We built, you know, doc type, HTML, head, body, some, all that stuff. Um, this has been amazing. So all of this stuff has been to improve tech literacy, but also to uh, promote engagement in younger students so that they build uh, some of that knowledge for when they're older and they're using screen readers more uh, in more advanced ways. It was overall, it was a really fun experience uh, to have. It was just like learning a lot about technology and how it all works and how you create all of these different like platforms and stuff. And the second station I actually had was a, a website I was created my own website. And then I looked up my website and it was on the internet. It was kind of crazy to see that. As I walked around the campus today, the level of engagement was, and, and for it to be campus wide, everywhere I went today, there was a level of excitement. And there were so many different activities, but the kids were engaged in everything just outstanding. The students got so involved in the uh, the mouse, the, the code and go mouse, and then the code jumpers. They really, and, and they were really um, surprising how quickly they figured out how to code that mouse to get to that cheese. And so it was just really cool with them challenging themselves and seeing uh, how well they did with, and how much they enjoyed it. A lot of excitement and energy in the room, so. One student using the code jumper. Uh, I, I just, off the top of my head, you know, I, I just keep coming back to the, the reactions that the students have when they are halfway through an activity and it just clicks. Um, there were a bunch of them where the students came in and it was just kind of like question marks. Um, you, you could kind of tell uh, but then the longer the activity goes on, the more exposure they get, you know, as, as the activity goes on, you, you start to see those light moments. And um, there are a couple students in particular that I'm thinking of, about that were saying, you know, this is so hard. Um, how are you supposed to do this? But then by the end of it, they didn't want to finish the lesson. They don't want to end the lesson because they, they were on it and they really wanted to finish um, because there was an activity that had an easy and a hard mode. They really wanted to finish a hard mode because they, they got it and they were really confident. And that, that, that is great to see is that confidence. Two students telling jokes and laughing together. Students waiting outside cafeteria. I think that it went way better than I anticipated. Um, I think that kids got really into the activities. 
I think that the teachers who participated really enjoyed it and they were, I mean, I heard so many times today, like we got to continue this in our classrooms or we got to try this activity ourselves in another way. And there's so many ways to expand on all the activities. Like it totally could be just another thing we do during tech time um, when we get, or we could help facilitate push-in or help facilitate classroom teachers, like expanding on these lessons, building the momentum. From my perspective and the reason we did the day of code and the reason we're doing the coding symposium as a whole is that myself as a teacher of the visually impaired um, as an administrator uh, i like what programming and coding can do for students who are blind and visually impaired but i know that it can open a door of interest and motivation for students um, that can inspire them to get better at keyboarding, can get better at their screen reader, can get better at navigating the technology tool of their of their choice, um, and or it can open up a door so that our students can become programmers or become tech workers in fields that are related to coding. Students participate in cup stacking activity. I am just so glad that um, the vision for this day of code has been taken to this level and I just see us going higher and higher and higher. This is just the tip of the iceberg as to what it's going to be in five or ten years. It's just going to be phenomenal. So I'm glad to be a part of it. Video fades to black screen. Well, that certainly wouldn't have all happened uh, without the Center for Assistive Technology teams, the CAT Centers, uh, both in Alabama and the Southwest CAT Center, as well as the Northwest CAT Center. Uh, it was an amazing, um, amazing event that we hosted in May to produce that video. Uh, and thank you to the CAT Centers that are now providing uh, accessible technology support almost throughout our entire country. And thank you for APH for organizing that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are doing that same type of event today. We've changed it up. We've provided new uh, lesson plans and curriculum for today to, of course, uh, engage our students who already participated. I did just drop into the APH Hive under the coding discussion board, uh, the link to our lesson plans. So our unplugged and plugged lesson plans. Uh, I linked in there from our computer science curriculum website at the California School for the Blind, uh, but you can gain access to all of the lesson plans we're using today. Uh, we have so many at this point that we don't even have uh, all of, we're not even implementing all of the lesson plans that we have up on our website, which is very exciting. They are designed to be about 40 minute sessions. Um, knowing that you might not be available or have access to a full day of code activity, but you're working with your TVI, working at home as a student, they should be accessible. Um, please go ahead and check them out and try them once a week, once a month, a uh, whole bunch in a row. Uh, we're looking for ways to motivate students. So uh, check them out. We're very excited to be here today, uh, December 4th, the first day of the Computer Science Education Week to kick off National Day of Code at California School for the Blind. And Leslie, I know that you guys did something pretty fantastic in Washington as well. Leslie, you're muted. <laughs> it's Monday. Um, oh, yes, we, we uh, thank you, Adrian. We definitely took the, that idea and ran with it in Washington, some kind of full day event. And um, the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library reached out to me saying, hey, we have a code jumper, but we, we haven't used it. Will you help us use it? I'm like, hey, guess what you just volunteered to do? <laughs> You're hosting a day code. So I'm going to share my screen. Possibly. Um, there we go. And. There we go. Okay. Um, so first of all, I just want to thank the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library in Seattle. Uh, 
the Cat Northwest uh, team for joining in the fun and um, the 14 students, parents, and teachers who participated in this. This was just earlier in the month of November, so I don't have a super cool video to show, but I will uh, share a couple of highlights from our day. Uh, I just want to, to point out a few things about why we, what we were focusing on here. Now, in, in STEM, uh, solutions to problems are analyzed, reasoned, and interpreted by students who will use their math abilities in assorted real world situations. Uh, STEM presents a way for them to use their math in established problems that answers the question of when will I ever use this stuff? They actually got to see that application. Um, CCSSM, so the Common Core State Standards for Mathematical Practice, um, these focus on communication, problem solving, representation, proof and reasoning, and connections and in a con and con sorry connections <laughs> a combination of skills that deal with stem learning and i look i i looked these up and i was i don't know if we're going to get all of this in one day but it just so naturally flowed and now looking back through what we did i can identify it definitely uh, a couple of the products that we utilized, and we actually had much more than what you'll see here. Um, it, the first of all, we had a code jumper, and if you have not seen a code jumper before, it is similar to block style coding, but it is on the table in front of you. It is tangible pods. Um, you use pods to string code together, and uh, you can use songs, stories, and themed sound sets that you can customize. Uh, we also use the CodeQuest app. If you do not know about this app, it is a free app uh, that uses a, a beautiful grid on your iPad or iPhone and uh, you it, that is fully accessible with VoiceOver. You use problem solving to debug. Uh, you figure out the shortest route, the most efficient route, and even Arushi uh, mentioned that. Um, if it doesn't work, that's a bug. You find it and fix it. And mistakes are part of the learning process. So this is an app, but you can also download embossable levels uh, to just emboss on a, a index D embosser, like the Page Blaster and 3D print the characters so you can do it in a physical way. You can also get laser cut boards for this so you can have more of a, uh, a raised edge to um, walk your space person back to the spaceship so they don't um, get lost on their planets. It's very engaging. There's lots of fun sound effects. And uh, finally, code and, code and Go robot mouse. His name is Colby. And this is a little robot mouse with buttons on his back, forward, left, right, backward, that you build a, uh, a maze with tiles. And you figure out what Colby needs to do to get through that maze and find that cheese. There's if then logic, self-correcting, analytical thinking working collaboratively with others, discussion and communication skills, and calculating distance. There's a whole range of things. Um, so here is uh, just a quick an image of some of this teamwork. We had stations set up and parents, teachers, and students just went at it. I had 
a whole lesson plan. This is how you use each one of these. But it was such a rainy day that day. People trickled in and they just started working with it. They'd never seen these things before and they figured it out on their own and just kept expanding and kept expanding and kept expanding. There was so much energy and excitement in that room. It, 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 it was it was great to see. So these three students are building uh, a maze for Colby to follow along, and they are talking to each other to figure out why Colby keeps falling off. <laughs> so um, the family support was lovely. This one student, so we had students from six to seventeen. So there had to be a lot of communication between them. Uh, just figuring things out on um, who understands what. And this student was feeling a little left out until she got her hands on the code jumper. And this picture is her sitting at a table with both of her parents on either side of her. And they are all fascinated. They tried every pod out. They pulled up the lessons. They started working through every lesson methodically and trying so many different sound sets just to see what they could figure out together. It was really wonderful to see because now when she has some interest with this, at home her parents know what she's capable of and how to support her in it. Um, collabor the, the collaboration uh, really was fascinating. We did an escape room and these students had the challenge of, uh, well, you've you've crash landed on Mars. Um, you've got to get back to your ship before your oxygen runs out. And you have to build a science research pod to refill your oxygen in. And one kid said, wait, I know how to do this and started to do it. But then quickly went, mm something's not right. I need to use all these pieces. Can someone help me? And it really had that self-advocacy skill that even showed up. So now we're getting into some expanded core curriculum, which was awesome. Uh, so they are here playing with the uh, Geometros set, where they've taken some flat two-dimensional squares and pentagons and have now built a three-dimensional shape with those. Um, we wanted to activate the imagination of students and some, some students uh, definitely get more involved when you add some steam into this. So we had uh, an art project. Everybody really enjoyed Colby. So we expanded on that with let's build different kinds of mazes for Colby. So we had um, paper squares that they were able to glue pieces on and color and use wiki sticks and expand Colby's world. So we ended up with uh, a house, a place of work, uh, a school, a Trader Joe's so Colby could go buy some more cheese. Uh, it just kept going. And then they got to rearrange that. Well, if Colby went this way, then uh, could he still get to home if he has to go around these other obstacles? So we're adding a piece of orientation and mobility into that as well. You can make maps. And so he, this is a whole bunch of students and um, adults working on that. Um, finally, I have two short videos that I just captured with my cell phone, so they're not great, but I wanted to um, give you a snippet of, of the, the palpable excitement in the room. This first one is coding with Colby. Let me see if I can get it to activate. Um, and the collaboration that happened. One sec. We'll try that. Uh, you know what, Jeff? I'm going to stop screen sharing 
and you can, maybe, maybe I'm going to stop screen sharing. Here we go. Because it is not letting me. Well, Leslie's figuring this out. This is Adrian and Mandy back from California School for the Blind. Any of you out there who have interest in hosting a day of code similar to what they did at the Washington Talking Book Library or similar to what we're doing at California School for the Blind, please feel free to reach out to us at the California School for the Blind outreach team. Um, you can find our contacts and links on our website. Um, we'd be happy to share 100% of all of what we've done with forms and day plans and organization um, with you so that you can emulate our event or even work with you to create something something simpler and smaller. Any luck, Leslie? I'm going to see if I can get this to work. Yeah, there, there we go. go. All right. Can't hear it, Jeff. But uh, so we have three students working with Colby. He does when he gets his cheese. Oh, you can kind of hear. And he, Colby is going along the track and got his cheese. And immediately we have a big success. And immediately another student reaches out and says, but what if we change it and go a different way? So the it didn't stop with oh i got it i'm done it there was a definite i figured out how to do this now how can i up the challenge which is fabulous so then the other video jeff if you can pull that up so what i'm going to do because we're running a little behind schedule i dropped those links into the okay. chat so folks can we will have a break coming up a little bit later and folks can take a, a peek at those videos at their leisure um, just for the sake of time. So then um, I will just I'll just say that that second one is code and coding your dad. So if if you need some physical activity for a student, there was cushions on the floor and the student was telling his dad which directions to go. And it was it was really fun to see that engagement. So that that was uh, that was basically it. So thank you again. It was super fun to do. And we had a lot of people leaving asking when it when we were going to do it again. Yeah, I think the one common thread that everyone can detect from both of these events is that there was excitement and joy. And that's really what the goal of these events are, is to introduce coding in a friendly way and to really bring out the best engagement and excitement in our students. And that is very evident in both events that we were able to um, assist with this year. So um, we're looking forward to expanding this model further and moving into the next this next year. So thank you both, um, Adrian and Leslie, for sharing these opportunities with our audience. And we look forward to future work together. So, all right. So stretch your arms a little bit because we have a really exciting next um, uh, presentation that I'm excited to introduce. Um, they're, 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 uh, logo or their little theme. I got a little sneak peek back in October at our annual meeting event, um, something called Tada. Um, and they are debuting this. It's an exciting opportunity that is being shared from our team out of Washington. Um, Tada standing for Tangible Art and Design Adventures. And I'm going to turn this over to our presenter, Lee. Greetings, adventurers and coders. I'm excited to introduce to you the Tangible Art Design Adventures Curriculum, or TADA. And I'm going to share my screen. All right, so on the screen, um, you should see the TADA logo. Um, it looks like an aged map showing four map pins arranged across the map. Each pin has a print letter above it spelling out TADA. The first A pin is higher than the rest, the D pin is lower than the rest, and all the pins are connected at their base points by a dashed blue line marking a trail to a letter X. A pin tilted and pointing to the X like an exclamation point, and the map 
as decorative grid lines and mountain illustrations in the rest of the space. I'm your guide and I can't wait to lead this expedition, which will take us into the world of tactile art and design. Stick with me and you'll gain essential skills for navigating the terrain ahead. Before we embark, let me introduce you to the team behind the curating of adventures that make up Tada. Dr. Ting Su, coordinator of the CAT Northwest program and author of Access Technology for Blind and Low Vision Accessibility. Leslie Edmonds, CAT Northwest trainer, experienced TSVI and brave field tester. Danielle Montour, braille and tactile literacy educator and digital creator. Marco Salsiche, an, an accessibility expert and graphic and tactile designer. And lastly, my name is Lee Chandler, and I work for Washington State School for the Blind as the statewide STEM consultant. Now, exactly what, li what exactly lies ahead on our itinerary? Well, my fine explorers, breathtaking vistas and challenges await to stretch our creative muscles and build tactile fortitude. The DA is designed to be for anyone to use with a student of any age would like to learn non-visual basic drawing skills, spatial concepts related to coding, and how to create computer graphics. TADA offers a set of 10 activities that are organized as introductory, intermediate, and advanced points of interest that can be followed like an adventure map and punctuated with excitement. By following the TADA map, students can expect to learn to draw using physical media and materials, exercise spatial literacy with physical and virtual canvases, learn basic coding concepts, practice using accessible descriptive language, develop basic concepts for creating computer graphics, apply creativity and resilience towards drafting, rendering, and revision processes. Any individual of any age who may consider themselves a student of art and design can benefit from this adventure map. Teachers may use this broadly as a curriculum with students of any age and skill level with an emphasis on participation to any extent that is meaningful to the student. We encourage all students to create to their heart's desire and for teachers to embrace all efforts. Although we present a set of 10 activities with suggested materials and resources, we encourage adaptations to all the activities each step of every activity, and especially Indian all materials, tools, and resources so that all students may have an equitable opportunity to engage with TADA. Remember, art and design is for everyone. On this slide titled Introductory Points of Interest, there are three images of suggested tools and materials for the first three adventures. On the left, is a draftsman. In the middle is a tactile doodle, both of which are used to create tactile drawings. And on the right is a pile of multicolored textured paper. With the introductory adventures, we'll start by learning to render shapes, symbols, and sketches. Consider this base camp where we review essential gear and basics before setting off to summit digital graphics. After the first activity, we'll make tracks into more advanced terrain, navigating challenges that require describing images precisely so others can recreate them. Success here depends on clear directions, much like using turn-by-turn -turn directions instead of a compass. For the last activity in the beginning section, students will embark on a texture trek across sandpaper peaks and tissue paper valleys. Students will explore the rugged terrain of different tactile textures as students climb graph paper trails and use grids as guides. They'll create a map key by using different materials to represent colors in this tactile land. Armed with a textured palette, it's time for students to stake their claim. They'll drop their materials into pixel-sized pieces to construct, construct vibrant creations amongst the graph paper grids. On this slide titled Intermediate Points of Interest, there are three images of suggested tools and materials for the next four adventures. On the left is 
Code and Go robot. In the middle is a Wheatley board and all its pieces. And on the right is the illustrated astronaut character from the Code Quest app. With the intermediate adventures, programming concepts crisscross activity four and five's landscape as we code Colby, the Code and Go robot mouse, to traverse towns and mazes we design. If decoding errors or rerouting around faulty logic gets frustrating, remember that backtracking to rework your algorithm is all part of the process. The landscape expands with activity six when students plot points on coordinate grids to draw shapes. Students will traverse the coordinate grid using ordered pairs to chart Colby's path. Like explorers, students will rely on a grid to navigate this numerical terrain, plotting points to direct Colby's course, his path painting shapes amongst the graph paper terrain. Explore the galaxy in Activity 7. You will use an iPad in the CodeQuest app here, uh, you, where you are the astronaut stranded on alien planets. Your mission? Find your way back to your trusty rocket ship, but be prepared because you'll encounter attacking aliens. On this slide, titled Advanced Points of Interest, there are three images of suggested tools for the last three adventures. On the left is an open laptop with blindsvg.com on the screen, which you will use throughout all of the advanced activities. In the middle is a logo of Notepad++ text editor. The logo includes an illustrated chameleon standing on a pencil with a blank sheet of paper in the background. And on the right is the Pixblaster embosser. For the advanced points of interest, join us on an epic journey into the wild frontier of tactile drawing and digital creation. The uncharted territory awaits intrepid explorers ready to map out new worlds with pen and pixel. In lesson eight, we'll embark on our first expedition across the graph paper tundra. Like adventurers marking trails, we'll use rulers and as walking sticks to stake down geometric shapes amongst the dot paper underbrush. Measure twice and draw once, and keep coordinates to remember your way around this tactile terrain. Hills will become circles, rivers will become squiggling lines, and clearings will become rectangles as you chart your course. Once your dot paper is littered with shapes and symbols from your travels, it'll be time to digitize your discoveries in Lesson 9. Transfer your trail maps onto computers to transform sketches into digital images using SVG code. Morph from adventurer to coder as you crack the syntax safari, telling the secrets of shapes and values to your text editor. Embark through basic shape territory, then traverse more complex shape jungles by arranging code waterfalls that cascade from background to foreground. When your SVGs are ready, break out the embossers and swell paper to create a, a tangible terrain of the world you've created. Finally, with drawings in hand, compare your virtual voyage to the physical one. See if your tactile trails match with the computer rendered. Then celebrate your successful round trip. Conception to code to print. On this slide titled, Your Adventure Starts Here, I have a QR code that takes you to the adventure files. We'll also put a link in the chat. So from basic shapes to rendered landscapes, this coding curriculum will let your imagination run free. The spirit of adventure is coded right in if you're brave enough to venture or if you have gone before. Let your creati creativity blaze trails from physical to digital as you learn the tools to explore whatever virtual wor worlds you can dream up. Make sure to celebrate as your program runs or your embosser homes. Weeks later, as we share stories around the fire, recounting all we've accomplished, I know you'll feel up to the challenge of any creative task. Because by embarking on this Tanda expedition, 
you'll have gained tactile superpowers and problem solving power S that will serve you wherever your travels take you next. So what do you say? Who's ready to grab their gear and set forth? This is only the beginning. So I would like to kind of walk you through um, what the tactile uh, adventure map looks like. So if you follow the QR code or the link that I dropped in the chat, um, it will take you to a Google Drive folder. Um, and I've got that pictured um, on the left side of my slide. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that up. So from the Google Drive folder, um, you will see it starts out with a folder uh, entitled consumables, um, which all of those files are linked throughout the activities. Um, so you don't um, have to access them through there. Um, after that, uh, it is you will see the Tada map, which is your table of contents. You'll see the introduction, which is much of what it was covered in this presentation, and the foreword that goes into detail uh, the reason why Tada was created. And after that is the list of each of the activities. So once you get into uh, the folder, if you open up the Tada map or the table of contents, um, that is where you are going to um, find everything um, within the curriculum. So you can access the introduction, the foreword, um, each activity. There's also a description of each activity along with the goal um, of each, each adventure. So to navigate to that adventure or the introduction or foreword, you just click um, on the link and then that will give you a little pop-up window and then you click on that again and that will open up that activity for you. So thank you so much. Um, I can't wait um, to hear how your adventure goes and um, please don't hesitate to share any creations that you come up with. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. That looks really exciting. And um, it goes, it, I mean, that's just another piece of steam. You get the the art aspect of it and graphics are important to everyone as well. So thank you. Yeah, um, I, we were, we had the luxury of getting a little sneak peek of one of the lessons <laughs> uh, back at annual meeting, but th there's a whole lot more content for folks to check out. So if you hadn't been in there, or if you hadn't gotten to that sneak preview, I encourage everyone to have an opportunity to go take a look at there's some great content that I'm excited to go through myself. So thank you again, Lee, for um, sharing that um, and, content with us. And that is also, if you, if you missed it in the chat, it is also linked on the Coding Symposium webpage and it in the um, Hive Professional Community as well as the lesson plans Adrian mentioned. Trying to make it as easy as possible yeah. for people to get to this Lots content. Of places. So, yes. <laughs> so hopefully there are no, no secrets here. So, all right. So next up on our agenda for today, we have Marco, who is going to be talking to us about introduction to the blind SDG and creating computer graphics with the SDG code. Um, I'm going to go ahead. I believe we've got him here. All right, Marco, welcome and looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. My name is Marco Salsicha. I'm a uh, senior native mobile accessibility coach for DQ Systems, but a major personal project of mine for the past year has been developing this blindsvg.com website. And I'm really happy to be able to kind of share this with all, you all today. So a little background on myself. Um, I did start at DQ back in February, but prior to that, I was an accessibility specialist for Lyft for about six and a half years. Uh, but I actually went totally blind in 2014. Before I lost my vision in 2014, I was a senior animator, a visual effects artist, a motion graphics designer. And I also did quality assurance engineering for um, a software animation company. And I studied um, media arts and computer animation at, at an art college. So I was hypervisual. I was an artist. I loved to draw, loved to just create artwork, used Illustrator and uh, items like Inkscape and 3D, um, 3D modeling programs every single day. Uh, that was my life. 
And then when I lost my vision, I had to basically drop all of that. I was no longer able to animate. I thought I would never be able to physically draw again. I would never be able to create any artwork again. So I just kind of stepped away from that, accepted it, and moved forward into my new career within accessibility. Um, several, several years later, in fact, back in 2022, I happened to attend the National Federation of the Blind Conference in New Orleans, and I happened to meet Chansey Fleet, who was giving a presentation on tactile graphics and the production methods of creating tactile graphics. Um, and that included both physical drawing, included 3D printing, embossing, small form printing, thermoform. And you know, I thought it was absolutely amazing. And she introduced me to the... Um, it's about the uh, sensational blackboard and things like the draftsman where you know blind students and adults can use that to create actual physical hand-drawn uh, art you know which is kind of what this whole tada thing is going to be kind of focused on at least within the first few lessons but um sorry. uh so by by having this this new tactile drawing platform i was able to actually start drawing again and then on top of that, I was pointed to SVG or scalable vector graphics as a method of actually being able to produce my own illustrations again digitally, nothing through nothing but a little bit of code. Um, I was really uh, intrigued by this and started digging into it. And sure enough, I was able to actually start producing full on illustrations again, just using code and a text editor. Uh, opening files up in Google Chrome and then embossing them out or saving them out as images that were able to be you know, produced in a tactile format. Um, that uh, Chance's group also happened to manage a or run a blind SVG study guide, study group for a bunch of different blind creatives from around the world who were really interested in kind of the same process. And we all studied together and worked on learning how to code SVG. Um, I took it upon myself to kind of write a study guide and put that together in a Google Doc and shared it with everyone. And, you know, everyone really enjoyed learning and every week would come back with something new, some new feature that we could all put together and emboss and figure out just fun ways of producing new tactile graphics. And eventually uh, I ended up turning the entire study guide to taking it out of a Google Doc and building an actual full on website for, for blindsvg.com. And which I'll be going over a little bit later. Um, the basically the idea was to take all of the details from online that were all the tutorials that people have for SVG. They were all primarily meant for sighted web designers and illustrators, and uh, kept including a lot of things, um, just kind of bloated information that made it really difficult to parse and understand how to read it when you're just sort of going through it with a screen reader. And just trying to figure out how to do the basic concepts of the code. Um, so I was able to kind of get all that information out there, uh, boil it down to the, what we needed to do to produce tactile graphics and get that all put together into the website in, in a step-by-step -step format that anyone who has no experience with coding can get into it and start producing their own graphics pretty much within the first day. So what is SVG? So as I said before, scalable vector graphics, as the name suggests, they're producing graphics and made out of vectors instead of raster. So you're actually using numbers and math to produce the graphics themselves. You're not actually producing any pixels. You're not creating any photos or anything like that. And the word scalable means that these graphics that you're producing are infinitely scalable uh, down and up. So if you happen to make like a postage stamp size little logo, you can blow that up to a billboard size with no loss in any quality. Um, any It'll scale infinitely in any dimension. Uh, SVG is written as, uh, it's based in XML, so it's very similar to HTML coding. It uses CSS styling properties and uh, when you're putting it together, it's not, it doesn't work like a, like a progressive functional code. It's not like JavaScript. It's not like Python where you're write, writing one line and it's advancing. There's no control flow. It's, it's a, a markup language. So what you write, you're literally writing out the type of shape you're going to build. You're giving it a bunch of attributes such as size, position, color, uh, just different attributes like that. And 
you're layering all your shapes together into your drawing and you're outputting a, an actual graphic that's ready to be embossed. The uh, units and measurements of SVG is really interesting. They're all relative. So when I'm producing a tactile graphic, you're giving a canvas a width and a height because you have to have a canvas and you're putting something onto a canvas that you're going to be painting on essentially. And um, you can set that to any measurement that you're comfortable with. If you if you're good with working in millimeters, you know if you're going to be producing uh, an extruding 3D print, perhaps millimeters works better for you. If you're working in inches, if you're working in pixels, um, any unit will work when you're working within an SVG file. Uh, when you actually are working with an SVG, the canvas itself, the way to kind of think about it is if you have the canvas open in front of you. Uh, as I said, everything is based around numbers and math. So the upper left corner of the canvas, you can consider that zero, zero. That's your origin point. When we talk about zero, zero, that means X and Y. So X is the horizontal from left to right, and Y is the vertical from top to bottom. Uh, so if you, you've not moved anywhere on X, you've not moved anywhere on Y, you're in the upper left corner of your canvas. Now, when we're making the tactile graphics, I'm kind of using it in the understanding that most embossers are producing imagery at about 96 to 100 dots per inch. Um, so I kind of round that up to 100 dots an inch. So if I go from 0 to 100 on X, so I'm moving 0 to 100 left to right, then I'm producing a line or a shape that is one inch wide. And if I, of course, if I go down 0 to 100 on Y, then that's one inch tall. So when I'm producing a canvas, it's going to be in an eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper. That means that from zero all the way across to the, if I have it in portrait mode, then it's 850 units across. And if I go straight down, that's 1100 units down. So as students start going through this and, and understanding how to kind of multiply the, the units like that, they can start mentally mapping and having, doing spatial reasoning for creating the actual SVG canvas itself. So again, if it's 850 units across, that divided by two is 425, which ends up in the middle. 1100 divided by two is 550. So now you know that if I move over 425 and I go down 550, I'm smack dab in the center of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. And now if you break the numbers down from there, you start understanding the different quadrants of your, of your drawing. And you can start um, associating numerical values with where you want to position things around the actual canvas itself. Um, so when you actually produce an SVG, all you're literally doing is using a text editor. Uh, I'm on a Mac and I'm using text edit, but if you're on Windows, of course, you can use Notepad or Notepad++ or any text editor that you're comfortable with. And instead of saving out a .txt file, all you have to do is remove that file extension and save it out as a .svg. And then that'll tell the computer that this is a scalable vector graphic. And then uh, when you open it up in, a, in Chrome or Firefox as a browser to view it and print it, uh, it'll open up as an actual rendered image. Um, let's see. So let me take that, let me give you a little rundown of exactly what that would look like. So I'm going to share my screen really quick here. And I'm, I'm using VoiceOver. I have it slowed down a little bit, but I'm just going to share this. Sorry for all of the Zoomos has no window. There we go. So I'm going to switch over and see, I'm going to show you an actual SVG file. We'll kind of work, just work quickly through it together. Text edit. Text edit. Arrow key quick nav on. Arrow key quick nav off. So I'm in text edit on my Mac. I have an SVG file open. This is a little playground file that I made for this little presentation. Beginning of text. Less than SVG ID equals quote. So I'm going to kind of go through this character by character really quickly. Um, again, SVG looks a lot like HTML. It's written in XML format. And all you need for your own SVG file is to start with an opening and ending tag. So we open it with SVG. Less than. Like a less than. SVG. So there's our Golf. SVG element. Space. And then every attribute is separated by spaces here. So. ID equals. Quotation mark. So this has, happens to have an ID. 
D R A W N G quotation mark. So ID equals quote drawing quote. In edit tech version. These are just things that you have to kind of add to the header of the file. So you have an ID, you have an, a version equals quote 1.1. 1. 1. Equal quotation mark one period one quotation and mark. Note how there are no spaces between the, the equal signs of the quotes. Width equals quote 850 quotation mark. And this is the important part. The width is 850. So as I said, this is a portrait um, file. So it's 850 wide. Height equals quotation mark 1100 quotation mark. 1100 is the height. So that's where you set your canvas width and height. XMLNS. Now this part's a little squirrely. It's an XML namespace. This has to be in the file. Equals quotation mark. HTTP colon. To www period w3 period. It's a w3.org um, URL that has to be in the file in order for a browser to understand that it is a SVG file and that everything within the SVG element is written in XML and written for to actually produce the graphic. Um, on blindsvg.com, this code that sets this up is copyable and ready to go in the basic setup page, which I'll show you uh, in a bit. Uh, so you don't have to write all this out every time. What I usually do is just have, I open up a file, save it as a .svg, as like a template. I have all this ready to go, I save it. Then when I want to make a new drawing, I just open this file, save as, title it something else, and, just, and then start working on the drawing between these tags. So I already wrote, wrote a circle here. I'm going to navigate down. Less than circle CX equals quotation mark 100 quotation mark. So this is the next line in my file. I'm going to go down to the very last line. New line. Less than slash SVG greater than. So less than slash SVG greater than. So that's the end of the file. So your whole drawing exists between the, that opening SVG tag and this ending SVG tag. New line. Less than circle C less than SVG. And just to kind of go over this a little quickly, I have a circle. Less than circle. And just to show how to draw a circle shape, we'll go to the beginning of the line. So you literally start with the opening uh, angle bracket. Less than. Circle. Then circle. So just spell out circle. Space. Now, to put a circle on the canvas, you need to define where it is. So where is it on X? Where is it horizontally on the canvas? CX equals quotation mark. 100 quotation mark. So CX is center X, and it equals 100. So it's 100 units over on X. Psi. CY. Y. C. C, Y equals quotation mark one zero zero quotation mark is equals 100 quotation marks. So, so now it's uh, vertically down. And one part I forgot to mention is um, for those of you used with Cartesian coordinates or graphs, like zero, uh, zero to 100 on X is left to right. So X increases as you move left to right. But Y increases as you go top to bottom, which is a little backwards from usually you know, usually goes up. But in this case, Y goes uh, goes downward. So as Y increases, that means you're moving down the page. R. Now, when we talk about a circle, well, how do we define the size of a circle? Generally, diameter, radius. So in this case, we use R as radius, and that equals a number. Equals quotation five. So I put five. Zero. Quotation mark. I put fifty. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so fifty in radius. That means it's a one hundred diameter circle. And so those are the basic elements of a circle, but now you also want to give it some color. Fill. So we give a fill. So this is where we start getting into some of the CSS properties that all the shapes have. So fill equals quote teal quote, because teal is one of my favorite colors. Equals quotation T E A L quotation mark. Okay. So teal. Stroke. And then space and stroke. This is giving the outline of the image. Equals quotation mark or of the graphic and the circle itself. Orange quotation mark. And I mean, happen to make that orange. And then you give it a width, stroke width. Stroke height width equals quotation, five quotation marks left. Five. So the width of the stroke is going to be five. And then we end the shape by giving a forward slash and then the right angle bracket. Slash, quotation, quote, slash, greater than. Slash, greater than. And what happens is you just save this file. Save. And then you go over to Chrome, you open it in Chrome. It, it only works well in Chrome or Firefox. It, uh, SVG files like this do not currently work well in Safari uh, for this kind of implementation. And the nice thing about opening it in Chrome is that if you make a mistake, Chrome will actually debug it for you and tell you where in your code there is an error. So you can see what line it is, come back to your text file, go to that line and find the error and fix it. So if I move back over to Chrome. Zoom us, Google Chrome, Safari. Google Chrome, SVG underscore playground SVG. Remember? So I have my playground here. SVG playground SVG Google Chrome page has one image, image. So right now it's telling me there's an image on the screen. Image. 
a green and yellow circle on a white background. And so I just did a voiceover image recognition and it's a, well, it sees it as green and yellow, so I don't know why it's saying that, but that's a teal and orange circle that I just made here in SVG. Um, December 4th, 10, 26 a.m. Okay, good. You're on time. Text edit. Text edit. Arrow key quick nav on. So I move back to text edit. I'm just going to kind of... Arrow key quick nav off. Let's walk through a few more shapes. New line. Less than slash SVG greater than. New line. New line. New line. So I'm on a new line. Let's say you want to make a, a square. So we use the rectangle element to make a, a square, which makes sense because a square is a kind of a rectangle. Less than. And we say rect. So I'm going to type it less than R-E-C-T. R-E-C-T. That's a rectangle rect. space. Now we have to define the X and Y value of the top left corner of the, the rectangle. That's how you do that with this particular shape. So we say X. X, X equals, equals, apostrophe, apostrophe equals, quotation mark. So X equals quote. I'm going to put it next to the circle. So I'm going to say X is, uh, let's see, 100. I'm going to go to 300. Three, zero, zero, 300, quotation mark, space. Y. Y, Y equal, equals, quotation mark. I'm going to come down and do, uh, let's see, 100. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, just doing 100. One, zero, zero, 100, quotation mark. So it'll be a little lower than the circle. Space. Now with a rectangle, you define the width and height. So we say width. Dot D, T, H, width equals, quotation mark. I'm going to make it a, uh, 150 units wide. One, five, zero, 150, quotation mark. Space. And then the height. H, E, R, G, A, T, height equals, quotation, one, five, zero, 150, quotation mark. 150 units tall. And then same thing, I'm just going to, I'm not going to bother with the stroke. I'm... Actually, no, let's do that. Let's do a stroke. Let me show you what a space when you're coming out as a tactile graphic. We have some best practices that I have listed on the blind SVG website, and we're continuously coming up with more of these. But these are the color schemes that we use when you have a embossing or a swell form version that allows for multiple dot heights. Uh, there are a variety of different colors that we found work really well. So in this case, with this square, I'm going to fill space, space, F I L L L. L V equals quote yeah. quote uh, space. Sorry. Quotation mark. One hundred space. Sorry, I'm just kind of space. quotation mark. One hundred space. F I L L fill equals quotation mark. Okay. Fill equals quote. I'm gonna fill this with a CSS color called old lace. O L D L A C E old lace quotation mark. The nice thing about this is when you're using CSS, you can use color keywords instead of um well, there are multiple ways of, of adding color to objects, but color keywords are great because you can literally just say red, blue, teal, orange old lace, which happens to be a CSS extended color, brick red, dodger blue. Uh, there are a whole list, about 147 different colors you can choose from. So that's a big Crayola box of crayons you can play with. Um, but in this case, old lace happens to give, at least with my Columbia and Delta embossers from View Plus or uh, the APH variants, um, Pix Blasters, anything with a, with a variety of dot heights, they're going to give you a really nice subtle texture. Quotation mark, old ice space. And then the stroke. S O K E, stroke equals quotation mark. We'll just make it black. B L S K, black, quotation mark, space. And I have to give a stroke a width. S O K E, stroke, hyphen, W D T H, width equals quotation mark. So stroke hyphen width equals quote. And I'll just say, uh, let's give it four. Four, four, quotation mark. And then to end my shape. Slash, greater than. Forward slash greater than. And I'm going to save. Save. Go back to Chrome. Google Chrome. Click Chrome. Is I'm going to. Uh, Reload. SVG Playground, SVG Google Chrome, page has one image, image. Okay. A beige rectangle next to a green circle on a white background. So cool. So I got a beige rectangle next to my, my circle. And that's pretty much how quick, quick it is that you can um, hammer out these shapes. Um, and that particular one with the black and the old lace infill, that's going to produce a really nice uh, outline a very, that's easy to feel. And then the inside is going to have a nice subtle texture to kind of differentiate it from the white of the background paper. And if you come back to text edit, new line, less than rectex equals new line. So there are a few more new line. different shapes that you can do. There is a lips, there is a, um, you can make lines, uh, polylines, polygons, and you define those in a variety of different ways. December 4th, 10, 30 a.m. Okay. Less than. So let's say if we do um, an ellipse. E -L -L -P -E, ellipse. So with an ellipse, it works a lot like a circle. X, CX equals, equals, quotation mark. to give it a center. So I'm going to put this over on, uh, say, 600 on across. Six, zero, 600, quotation mark. I'm going to come down 100. Space, 
C Y Psi plus plus Psi equals equals quotation mark. That just means it's a little lower. I'm doing 200. Two, zero, 200, quotation mark, space. But with an ellipse, because you're, it's an oval, uh, you want to give it a radius. The radius of the horizontal is going to be different from the radius of the vertical. So to make a, let's make a wide oval. R X R X equals quotation mark. Say uh, 40. Four, zero, 40, quotation mark. For the radius of the X. Space R Y right equals quotation mark. 2, 5, 25, quotation mark. Let's say 25. Let's say 5, 20, 0, 20, quotation mark. For the radius vertical. So now it's it's double, it's uh, twice as wide as it is tall. Space. And let's just fill this with. F-I-L, fill equals quotation mark. O-E-D, red, quotation mark. Let's say red. And I'm not adding a stroke. I'm just giving it a fill. Slash, greater than, save. Okay. Google Chrome, Chrome. Is now back here. SVG Playground, SVG Google Chrome, page has. One image, image. No description available. Oops. No description available. Oh, of course, voice over to say it's not to. No description available. Image. <laughs> All right. No description available. Okay. So I'm just going to assume there's an ellipse on the screen. <laughs> Text edit. Text. A few other really interesting things that you can do with SVG. Arrow key quick nav on. Arrow new line. Less than beginning of text. So all the shapes are in blindsvg.com. It gets into a much, uh, much more complex and advanced things that you can do, such as using paths. And paths are very neat. So if, if students are familiar with Turtle, Turtle Pie, or actually with the Code and Go mouse as well, because you're giving it actual directions of moving something around a space, with paths in SVG, it works very much the same way, where you're giving a series of commands to SVG to take a pen and put it on a piece of paper and move it around the uh, the canvas. Beginning of text, less than circle CX equals less than SVG ID equals beginning of text. Less I'm sorry, I'm moving around. I'm going to jump back to this. I'm going to put a line over here above my circle. Less than circle C. New line, new line, new line, new line. Less than SVG ID, new line. Kind of demonstrate that really quickly line. because this is it's a pretty complex topic, but you can do. Less than P -A -T -A path. The path. D, D equals quotation mark. Data is or D equals quote. Cap M, cap M. And then you start using a series of letter codes and X and Y coordinate values to move the pen around. So M is move the pen to a position. Move the pen to three zero three hundred 300, 300 on X, comma, space. And 300 on Y. Three zero zero 300. Quotation mark, quotation mark. So M space 300, comma, 300. I'm going to just make a vertical uh, line downwards. 300 tap. I'm going to tell... Tell uh, SVG to make a line. Cap L, cap L. To 300 on X. Three, zero, zero, 300 space. 500 on Y. Six, zero, 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 six, five, zero, zero, okay. 500. So that makes a line. New line, tap. I'm going to say. Cap L, let's cap make L. A 40, let's make a line down to 400 on X. Four, zero, zero, 400 space. And 600 on Y. Six, zero, zero, 600. And maybe just end it there. So it's just like a kind of a down. Uh, goes down and it kind of moves down at a 45 degree angle. I'm going to hit quote. Quotation mark. Close that. And I'm going to say. Space. This is a little line, so I'm going to give it a stroke. S O O K E. Stroke equals quotation mark. Let's make this green. R E N. Green. Quotation mark. Space. And stroke width. S O K E. Stroke. D H. Width equals quotation mark. One, zero, ten. Quotation mark. Of ten. Slash. Greater than. Save. And save that path. Google Chrome. Chrome. Back to Chrome. CG underscore playground SVG. Memory use SVG playground SVG Google Chrome. Page has one image. Image. Okay. An illustration of a black triangle next to a red circle and a green triangle. Detected document. Possible text. K. Okay. So uh, that, drew, that basically drew a path. It took the pen, put it to a certain point, moved it down vertically, and then I moved it down in a 40, lower 45 degree. Text edit. Text. But it's very similar to the, the coordinates that you were giving, you know, the mouse or giving any kind of thing to move it through a space, which is kind of fun when you think about using a path to move a pen through your canvas to create drawings. Arrow key quick nav on. Arrow tab less than path D equals quotation mark at new line. New line, new line. Another thing for SVG. Less than. E. Title greater than. Cap cap A. E. What reads O. O. Echo D. O. E. G. Drawing. Less less than. Slash. E. Title greater than. You can add a title. I usually add that as the second line. And when Save. when you have a title and you open it back up in your Chrome, Google Chrome, a Chrome, a really cool on Google Chrome page has one image, a really cool drawing image. So now the the title of the of the image is announced by uh, Google Chrome. Text edit text and about alt text. New line less than title greater than a really new you line. You can do that with description tags. 
Less D E F C desk greater than Cap R R D E T I D I D I G drawing less than D E F C desk greater than. And again, that's not actual alt text that you should ever use, but Save. just to just to demonstrate. Google Chrome, the Chrome, a, a really cool drawing. Google Chrome page has one image, a really cool drawing. Image. Marco made this drawing. So you hear the, the description text that gets announced as well. You hear the title and the description text. So it's really good to have students title their drawings. And once they're, they know what they've done or they have some visual interpretation of what they've done, they can add a good description. So when they share that with other students or anybody else, they can hear the alt text immediately from the file. Text edit. Text edit. And there are a lot of other interesting things, but they gen generally that's what that's how you build an SVG file. It's all written within this code. I'm not, it's, there's nothing with my platform. It's literally just writing it in a text document, opening it in Chrome, and then from Chrome, printing to your embosser, printing to your swell form paper, um, and even cr producing like extrusion files for 3D printing. And let me quickly go over uh, blindsvg.com. Google Chrome, Zoom us, Safari. Take Safari, SVG setup, blind SVG study guide, window, voice over setting. Oh, and I apologize. I'm not checking the chat or anything. I don't know if there are any questions coming up, but um, yeah, happy to take more at the end of this. Less than SVG version equals one point. Copy SVG setup. Less than SVG version equals. Right, let me go. Let's recommend heading level one. I'm just moving through the screen. Heading level one. SVG file. May end of visited link. Skip to banner. Visited link image. Blind blind SVG navigation. List eleven items. Current page link. SVG setup. Visited link home. Visited link. Skip to content. So here's blindsvg.com. This is the website that I built in order to produce uh, a way for anyone to kind of learn how to do all this drawing and create these graphics without getting inundated with all of the web, the front end web developer code that comes with every other online tutorial. Um, SVG can be animated. It can be produced dynamically using JavaScript, but that's well beyond the scope of my presentation today. It's really cool. Like you can produce interesting graphs and things, but um, if you just want to produce some good tactile graphics, and you just want to render something quickly and not have to learn how to do a variety of CSS tips and tricks and techniques, then I want, you know, that's why I built the site because I want to know how to make the shapes, how to make paths, how to make curves, do interesting styling to help promote tactile graphics and image literacy and provide just a one-stop shop for everyone to kind of come through and, and really learn all of this. So through blindsvg.com, I have it broken down into a tutorial like progression. Banner, link, image, blind SVG home logo, blind SVG, navigation, list 11 items, current page, link, visited, link, SVG setup, so two of 11. You have setup. Visited, link, basic shapes, three of 11. Basic shapes. Visited, link, paths, four of So you learn about paths and curves. Visited, link, curves, five of 11. Visited, link, text and styling. Text and styling. You can add text. Um, and really interesting when you add text in an SVG document, it will actually become accessible text. So if you open it in a browser, uh, voiceover, JAWS, and MVDA will be able to focus on the text. Link, transforms, 7 of 11. Of course, with transforms, ways of rotating, moving, and scaling, and grouping your shapes together. Visited, link, gradients, eight of, visited, link, advanced. Not gradients and advanced, so gradients providing more color, that's, it's, Useful if you're producing a, like aesthetic things, but also for 3D printing, not as much for embossing. This visited, but really good for small form as well. This visited link advanced nine of eleven. And then there are many advanced features as well, creating patterns, creating. Uh, so you're not copying yourself around the interface. You can produce one shape and then use in a use element where it looks at that shape and produces another copy of it. Visited link output slash printing ten and then output and printing. So I have a variety of techniques here talking about embossing primarily and turning your SVG drawings into PNG, JPEG, uh, how to output as a raster pixel uh, document. Link, contact slash feedback, end of list. And of course, contacts and feedback. Um, but I'm really excited to move forward with this website. I'm gonna be producing more tabs specifically to show off projects and do tutorials. Uh, about breaking down more advanced graphics. And if any of you produce any cool graphics, I want to like highlight them here on the website as well and how the students put, it, put them together and kind of make a little project gallery. Um, and then as I keep lear learning and finding out more ways of producing SVG graphics, and I'm going to have them host here. I'm going to always have the site updated. It's a live site. I want people to use it to give me feedback in order to you know, make this a, the best learning experience possible. I tried to break everything down into digestible chunks uh, to ex explain everything, every part of the process conversationally. 
uh, if I move to the basic shapes. List 11 items. List 11. Cur visit, visited. Link. Basic shapes. Visited. Link. Skip to content. So here's a page of the basic shapes where each shape is represented visually. Heading level 1. Basic shapes. Heading level 2. On this page. Heading level 2. Introduction. Heading level 2. Link. Rectangle. So let's say there's a rectangle here, which you, which you saw me code by hand. A 100 by 100 unit square with a black outline and an old lace fill image. Rec snippet. Region. So every every shape, every bit of code, it has a little code snippet. Less than rectex equals 10, y equals 10, with equals 100, height equals 100, stroke. So it's very similar to what I wrote in my code. But for students who you know need a little help with the coding or not quite used to the syntax. We'll copy rec code button. You can code copied. easily copy the code from, uh, from my website. Text edit. Text edit. Come back to text edit. Arrow key quick nav on. Less than tab L 300 comma. Tab L 4 new line. New line. Greater than. And you have the code ready to go. Just paste it right into your document. Tweak it. Edit it. Emboss it. See how it works for you. December 4th. Right. 10. 41. 8. Safari. Safari. End of. This code will produce a 100 by 100 square word. While you can use any color for the stroke and fill. Remember our set of standards from the home page. Black will be the most pronounced for good and busters well-formed shape outlines. And old laces. And so, yeah, as we go through like all the different shapes, I kind of call out what they're good for. And ultimately, what this comes down to is what, you know, why, why SVG? Why, why does this work and what's important about this? This, again, gives, it gave me the ability to kind of create uh, illustrations again. And it opens up a whole new creative level for any kind of you know, K through 12 students, any blind adults, low vision adults. Anyone who wants to tap into more creative outlets, especially for digital, you know, digital creation, uh, there's so many different uses for this. I personally, after producing a bunch of different graphics, I started doing commercial logo design again. So I'm actually creating logos for um, businesses that they're going to be using in all of their work. Uh, you can use SVG to produce circuit diagrams if you have students that are interested in building circuits and creating their own, you know, their own projects. Uh, event coordinators can use SVG to position tables around an event space. Interior design, architecture, maybe you want to lay out your dorm room for a college coming up and you want to see exactly how everything will fit together. And you can use SVG to kind of tie, dial in the exact uh, you know, measurements of what you want to, want to add into, into your room. Um, data visualization is a big one as well. So if you want to produce your own charts and graphs um, from data that you have, there are ways of doing that. Uh, and, you, and you have full control over exactly how it looks and how well it, it embosses or is produced in a tactile format. Um, 3D printing, of course, you can use this SVG to produce tactile maps, or sorry, you can use it to produce uh, extrusion maps. Um, you can use SVG to produce uh, tactile maps, of course, if you want to draw a map to something. Uh, it can be used with cry cut machines to produce stencils. And it gives you know the opportunity to kind of learn a brand new set of coding skills, it helps typing skills, and uh, it's just one more outlet that we have to, um, to really produce interesting graphics. Let's see. Important. Note how there is a forward slash just before the closing angle bracket. So I'm going to move through the, through the site a little bit more. Heading level one. And jump back to the top here. So again, every every uh, shape is in there's heading structure. I, I built this as usable as possible. Heading level two. On heading level two. Heading level two. Link. Rectangle. Every page has a little. He heading level two. On this page. On this page section. List eight items. One of eight. Link. Introduction. Two of link. Three of eight. Visit it. Link. Circle. So you can have like a, a, a easily navigable little table of contents at the top of every page. And then if you jump by landmark. Ellipse. Link. Line. Link. Polyline. Link. Sorry. Yeah, if you... Arrow key. Quick nav on. Words. Window. Link. Headings. Form control. Landmarks. Rect snippet. Region. Rounded rectangle snippet. Region. Circle snippet. Region. Like every region is a, I have landmark regions for all of the different code snippets. So it's easy to jump to those. Ellip line. Polyline snippet. Polygon snippet. Region. So again, let's pop line ellipse circle snippet region. So we went through circle ellipse snippet region, line snippet region. So a line again that will produce a line that goes from a, an x and y value to an to an x two and y two value. Polyline snippet region. Polyline is rather interesting because that will produce less than polyline points equals zero zero ten ten thirty five fifty eighty one hundred ten one hundred forty five seven. So within the code here, you have a polyline, and it takes a points attribute, or all you do is you put in a, a series of x and y points. And you can use that to basically like uh, connect the dots. So you have uh, a starting point, put the next point 
so x and y value is separated by a comma, then space, and then the next x y value is separated by a comma, then space, and you're connecting the dots in your in your drawing. Polygon snippet region. Polygon is exactly the same thing. You're adding an x and y values into a points attribute that allows you to uh, connect all the dots. But the the final thing is it will close the shape. So really good for just building, you know, street signs, any, any kind of polygons, triangles, any kind of fun little shapes that you want to make, trapezoids, dodecahedrons. <laughs> tutorial, navigation. And then at the end of each page, there is a tutorial. So there's a way to step forwards through uh, through each step of the process. Visited, link, previous page, set, visited, link, current page, basic shapes, jump to talk, visited, link, previous page, set up, visited, link, skip to content. So I did jump straight to the, uh, to the shapes, but if you come to the setup page, which is the first step, Heading level one, SVG file setup and use. This will give you the, co the copyable code to create that template file I, ta I talked about in the beginning, where you just copy the code off of this page, paste it into a text file, save it as a .svg file, and then use that whenever you want to produce more graphics. Just save as, add all, you know, start, and start building your graphic from here. Heading level two. This also talks about the sizing and units. Heading level two, introduction. He heading level two, link, view box and scaling. Yeah, so sizing and units, view box and scaling, a little more advanced techniques here, but it really boils down the whole width and height of the entire file canvas and how that usually, how we use that to export out to embossed files. Um, but if you're producing more digital graphics, there are a few different techniques here that I try to explain, uh, but all the code is copyable. And again, all syntax is really, really important. So uh, you just kind of follow, follow along with all of that. While we are primarily concerned with build copy SVG setup code to clipboard, button, end of, heading level two, link, testing and debugging SVG code, tutorial, navigation. Let's come back to the tutorial and just kind of do a quick run through. December 4th, 10, 47 a.m. Oh, okay. V visited, link, current page, setup, jump to talk. Um, so, yeah, actually, uh, let's see. Visited, link, next page, basic shapes. Yeah, that's blindsvg.com. Um, if there are any questions, uh, happy to take them now. But um, yeah, again, with SVG, it's just a text file. Uh, it's a perfect way to produce all, all manner of graphics and illustrations in lieu of Illustrator and Inkscape and any other digital asset creation technology not being accessible to us, the screen reader users. Um, and I really hope that you know pe people take this and run with it. It's been awesome being able to draw again. And I, wanted, I was really happy to be able to get this out there for anyone to kind of just use it at their uh, with all of the technology that they're making, and all the art that they're creating, um, so I'm just been really excited to show this and kind of kind of add this to the toolbox that Cat has for all of their teaching and training. Let me stop sharing my screen really quick. Text edit, Google Chrome, Zoom us, Zoom us, Zoom share toolbar window. Thank you, Marco. That was really interesting. Is that I think the theme has emerged with just what people have been wanting to present on is this need for tactile graphics and this need for for art. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any questions or anything from the audience? We're checking the chat now. Uh, there's comments about this is beyond awesome. I'm sure a lot of people are blown away. I don't, I don't think we were expecting to be <laughs> the idea that you can whip up graphics that quickly is pretty amazing onto itself. Mm -hmm. So we'll just give a moment to see if anyone has any outstanding questions. Um, there's also the opportunity for folks to post any types of clarification questions or uh, for further information in our discussion board if they choose as well. So. Mm -hmm. um, just getting some thank yous and all, but thank you, Marco, for sharing your expertise and information on this wonderful tool. Um, at this time, if there are no questions, I think this is the perfect opportunity to take a break. Um, so we would like to take a 15 minute break and I would like to share before we um, go on break, I'll put a, you know, try to share a timer so everyone will know when we're coming back. Um, for those of you who may think you're getting a little over your head with our, our coding conversation, I want to reassure everyone that our intention is to have something for everyone. And so right after the break, we're going to be hearing from a wonderful presenter, Leon Husk, about some coding opportunities for students who may not be in, in quite at this level of coding. And I think people find it really fascinating as I did. So um, let me go ahead and try to share my screen. And I will... 
So we'll be back at 205 yeah. Eastern. <laughs> and Everybody. I will start our countdown timer now. So everyone stretch, get a snack, use the bathroom, and we'll see you back in 15 minutes. Thank you all. All right. Hopefully everyone had an opportunity to stretch their legs, get a potty break in there. And um, my coworker was eager. I would uh, have her having us doing some yoga stretches, but I, I won't put her on the spot like that. <laughs> anyway, um, welcome back. Um, making sure we have our next guest speaker here. There, I think I see Leanne here in the room. Hello, Leanne. So okay. what we so our next presentation now. Be excited to introduce our next speaker, who is Leanne Husk with Bridges Canada. And her topic for today is steaming into the school year with debug coding. So I won't take any extra time. We're a little early, Leanne. Are you prepared to go? I'm I'm good to go whenever you're ready. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're all set. So welcome. It's good to see you again. Yeah, you as well. I'm just gonna get my screen set up here. How's that looking? Looks perfect. Great. Um, I am going to ask somebody then to monitor the chat. Happy to have any interruptions as you see fit um, throughout if people have questions or, or want to share something. Totally good with that. So just let me know. I see one just popped in, but I think we're good. OK. Um, so it's okay to get started then? You don't want me to wait until the exact time? We're all good? No, I think you're all set. We were running a few minutes ahead, but we gave a 15 minute break. So everyone had a, a timer, so. Yeah, yeah, I think we're good. So I apologize. There was supposed to be some audio there. Um, that was my bad. I probably didn't set up my audio correctly. So <laughs> next time. <laughs> ah, technology, right? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So. Well, thank you so much, um, and, and thanks to everyone joining in today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Leanne Husk. I work for a company in Canada called Bridges. Um, I'm currently in a dual role there. Um, one half of me is a product manager. The other half of me is a professional learning instructor. And if you're not familiar with Bridges, we're a full service assistive technology company um, that supports all individuals who have uh, learning, communication, alternate access, low vision or blindness needs all across Canada. And I am thrilled to have been invited today um, to get to speak to you about a recently released accessible coding kit series that we've affectionately named Debugged. And as one of the co-authors of this curriculum, there is going to be way more that I would love to share with you um, that I will not be able to fit into a single hour. But what I hope is that I'm going to be able to do a good enough job in this next hour to get you as excited as we were about developing it so that you want to learn more. So what exactly is debugged? You're probably wondering. Well, it's the result of a three-year grant that we received from the Canadian government a couple of years ago. And they tasked us to create a sustainable, fully accessible solution that would ensure anyone could learn how to code. As I'm sure many of you have already discovered, most of the robots and coding applications that are available out on the market right now just are not designed with accessibility or learning challenges in mind. And there is a lot of them, but we only had three years. <laughs> um, so we had to start somewhere and we decided to start designing for robots that might already be popular, like Dash and Dot on the screen on the far left. Um, and we also thought it might be nice to also look for things that had a lot of access opportunities already built into it, like the cubelets that are there on the screen second to the right. In the end, we did manage to complete fully three kits, so Dash and Dot and Cubelets, and then um, Cubetto, which is the third um, robot that you see on the screen from the left. And Bluebot, the fourth one on the far right, 
um, is in the final stages of development. And we really hope that we get an opportunity to finish that one and add it to our collection sometime over the next year. It was a big task, as you can really imagine. We knew that in order for this to be beneficial out there that it needed to be 100% complete. So if I could just fast forward to the end product, complete meant that our kits were needing were going to be comprised of three parts. The curriculum guide that you can see a sample of for Dash and Dot on the left side of the screen, that contains all of the lessons and information that educators will need to provide fully accessible experiences for a particular robot. It also includes a bin that's pictured in the middle of the screen. It's filled with pre-prepared key materials um, that are needed for the exploration and learning um, opportunities that you'll be doing from the curriculum guide. And then finally, a digital key and a sample of that is on the right of the screen where continued access to everything is provided. So everything that we provide in that um, bin in the middle is also accessible digitally so that you can create more of whatever whenever you need to. The only thing that's not included digitally is the curriculum guide. Each one of our kits development was guided by universal design for learning in order to ensure that as we created, we were grounded by that evidence-based best practice that we all know to be the most effective approach to teaching. So the chart that I have on the screen here is outlining the thoughtful considerations that we incorporated into each of those three areas of universal design to ensure that all students, regardless of their abilities, would be able to actively and meaningfully um, participate in coding activities and be as independent as possible. We all know that when you design from those edges, you're gonna catch everything in between too. So for the engagement um, part of UDL, we paid special attention to preparing our learners for those new experiences that they were about to have and supporting them so that they would strive to take risks and then also address the unique needs that each one of them presents to us. For representation, we started with assuming nothing. So before any learning takes place, we take time to build or activate background knowledge on that, on that particular topic for that lesson, and then ensure that all learning experiences were offered in multiple different ways with a variety of supports in, in place. And then for action and expression, we provide ways for students to show their learning as independently as possible. That was the top of the list. Sending students off confidently meant that we needed to embed modeling and guided practice opportunities prior to that application opportunity to ensure that they were available to students at all levels of engagement. And while the educators that are joining us today might appreciate that UDL approach, if there are students that are joining today, they might have found that a little bore. But what the co-design approach that I'm about to talk about might make little might, might make um, things a little bit more interesting for them. We knew that UDL was fundamental, but it wasn't the only thing that we needed. If we truly wanted to end up with something that could meet every single student's needs, we had to go to those experts and make sure that that's what they actually needed. So everything that we developed was created, tested, and modified through a co-design approach with tons of professionals and students in the mix. And the coolest part of that whole experience was that the students themselves essentially became the driving designers of all of these kits. And because we wanted to make sure that inclusivity was a generalized theme throughout our development as well, we made sure that those co-designers that we included in all of our opportunities included the greatest range of people, ages, abilities, so on and so forth that we could possibly find. And that was really, really intentional because we wanted these students and their frontline workers to guide our development right from the beginning so that we would get it right. One thing that we really quickly discovered in the beginning was that coding really isn't just about programming. 
Yes, coding, uh, learning to code is a really important new skill in our world today. But I think um, we can all agree, A, it's really, really fun. <laughs> and B, um, the soft skills that we learn during these experiences, like communication, collaboration, critical thinking, all of those soft skills are just as important if not more important than the coding concepts that we're learning. We call those the coding to learn concepts. And we made sure to emphasize all of those as well throughout all of our lessons. Don't get me wrong, the coding skills are important too. And we've covered a bunch of them throughout those kits. Every kit though focuses on relevant coding expectations for students between kindergarten and grade eight but they varied according to each robot's capabilities. Every single one of those robots will have a different scope and sequence, um, but they also have the capability to extend learning beyond the scope and sequence that we've included in our lessons. Because our hope is once you've completed the lessons, you're gonna have the knowledge, the confidence, and the materials to continue learning and exploring on your own. One other thing that our co-design ed educators emphasized was how important it was that we designed to cross over into all other areas of the curriculum in order to create more integrated and creative learning experiences. Our kids told us that that was a really good call because it made learning some of those other subject areas that might have been a little drier much more fun. So all of the kits, too, will incorporate topics across the curriculum, including language, science, math, social studies, and even the arts. Okay, so that was just kind of a little background on what the kits involved. And to give you a sense of how our co-designers helped us design and shaped our debugged coding kits, I thought it might be fun to kind of walk you through some of the components in reference to universal design and uh, show you some of their experiences in action. So why don't we start with how they relate to engagement for our learners. Preparing students for new learning starts with the educators. And because coding is so new, we discovered educators with strengths and needs that were as vast as the students that they teach. So we were really, really intentional to partner with educators with different backgrounds and comfort levels in order to see what was truly needed to make sure that every teacher felt prepared. So in the curriculum guide, we made sure to outline very clear objectives for every single lessons, for every single one of the lessons, um, organize the materials by component so they could grab what they need when they needed it, provide explicit instructions that are broken down into incremental steps, and even include scripting for the teachers to talk them through those steps. Lots and lots of scaffolding ideas are provided so they can reach every single one of their learners um, as simply as possible. And we include an instructional slide deck so that they can ref, um, refer to all of those steps and scripts as they're presenting them to the students. Our co-designers also helped us craft a whole boatload of creative application ideas and ideas for extending and connecting the learning into other areas of the curriculum and the students' daily lives. And because Bridges is Bridges, we also offer a ton of different training packages to really support our teachers with these new endeavors. Teachers that were brand new to coding told us and showed us how much they appreciated the instructional slide decks that we provided and the incremental um, steps and scripting that paired alongside of it. So on the left side of the screen is a small sample of a, of a partial slide deck. And on the right side of the screen is the, um, a sample of the incremental steps in black and the scripting in blue that would accompany the instructional slide deck so that the teacher would be walked through um, that portion of the lesson. All of those slide decks I'm talking about and the instructions introduce new concepts in the most relatable concrete way possible in order to support our students' understanding. 
after they got that concrete example, we transition into showing what the real world example might look like as code. And then finally, we apply our understanding of that by creating a new authentic program using the coding interface um, for that particular robot. One educator also told us that those slide decks came in handy as she prepared to understand some of the more complex um, cubelets concepts that she was herself learning. Um, and this particular type of learning, cubelets is, is kind of a new way of, of learning how to code. And that was a really new experience for her. So she found a lot of benefit in using the slide decks to prepare for her own learning. Even skilled, confident early adopters need support. And this is one of those teachers. This is Kathleen. She was uh, teaching a high school special education classroom when she um, agreed to partner with us. And after she finished um, lessons, or she, she delivering both the Dash and Dot and the Cubelets curriculum with her class, she shared some really insightful things about her experiences with the curriculum that I'd like to share with you. Um, each lesson is like very detailed. So you, I feel like as a teacher, even new to coding, you would never get lost. You would never not, you wouldn't be, confused about what you needed to teach or where you needed to go or why something was important to teach or explain. Um, so it was very accessible from a teacher's perspective, regardless of your experience. Um, I also really liked how the lessons were designed. They were in a very specific order and everything that you taught in that order made sense. I think that I probably would have rushed through learning way more quickly um, and I wouldn't have taken my time with the lessons if I didn't have the curriculum. Like if I was just doing this on my own and creating my own lessons, I, I think I would have just been like, okay, this block does this and this block does that and like let's put it together and would have stuck with the code instead of bringing the world into it as well. Um, the educator input that we got from Kathleen and tons of other teachers was absolutely invaluable. Early adopters like Kathleen inspired things in us. For example, the quick reference page that I have a sample of on the right hand side of the screen. We developed this page because she was comfortable after she skimmed the lesson. She just needed some jot dot or like some dot jots to refer to as she was going through the lessons to ensure that she hit all of those really important points while she taught. Her feedback also helped us realize that while providing lots of support is great, it can also be really overwhelming. So we created a document called Keys to Success, and that an example of that is on the left side of the screen. This is a summary of what resources are available to educators as they relate to the lessons that um, they're starting to get into and why they're helpful so that they know why or, or when to implement them. And in response to another teacher who we worked with, we created the symbols that you see down the center. And those symbols um, were designed to draw attention to specific resources that they had available to them for a particular activity as they encountered them so that they wouldn't forget that they had those available to them. Of course, managing all the energy and excitement and the uncertainty even sometimes with learning to code is essential. And like I said earlier, we assume nothing, not even when it comes to educators. So we provide things like engagement strategies. Um, an example is time to listen um, on the left of the screen. Visual schedules and some examples are down the middle of the screen, just in case a teacher needs them. Um, the lessons themselves, too, were built intentionally with a very consistent structure, um, and the structure is um, on the right side of the screen, and that provides both students and staff with a very familiar, predictable approach to every lesson. So when we're learning to code, we always start by introducing the concepts that are going to be covered in that particular lesson. We anchor their understanding by either building or activating background knowledge. We model new 
skills for them. We don't just expect them to know how to do it. And then we give them time to practice that skill in a very guided and supported way. Then we send them off to imply that new understanding, and then we pull them back all together to reflect and share after. Before the learning even begins, though, we at Bridges have always believed in preparing our students for the challenges and the changes that they're going to face. And so all of our kids have social stories to start lesson one off. This helps demystify the learning ahead, acknowledge some of those big feelings that they may have, um, and give our students an opportunity to learn and practice the language and the strategies that they might need in order to work through situations that could be a potential struggle. In some kits, we even developed additional social stories um, in order to address particular situations that were unique to that robot or application. And boy, do these work. We have seen the benefits of taking the time to prepare our students in this way over and over and over again. And on the screen, you can just see some really um, simple, quick shots of a couple of pages that we would include in our social stories. And that is a picture of one of our groups of learners um, taking in one of those stories together. Here's one example of how effective a social story can be. This is Henry and Kaya. Henry had not yet ever been successful working with a peer partner for an activity up until this point. And we wanted him to get there. So we created a social story called Working Together. And this story addressed the difficulties that can arise when we work with a partner or within a small group. And then we provide strategies um, for being a good partner that included meaningful roles that they can play when it's not their turn to handle the robot or the device. So we read it together with, as a whole class. We don't just isolate that learner. We read it together with the whole class. And then we provided Henry with a reference page that you can see in the bottom right of the screen. And that page was there to help remind him of the strategies he learned through the story um, so that he could apply them during his um, opportunity. And here's what Henry was able to do. So he's and you can see he's practically sitting on his pants, but he's not touching the device because it's Kaya's turn. He is helping her verbally though. So you, which direction is that left or right? Do you need to and then they celebrate together. And that was a huge moment for all of us. And we were so proud of Henry. Here's another example um, of a great um, teamwork that occurred after using the same social story. This is Serena and Lily. I want you to watch how they managed to work seamlessly together and collaboratively in really meaningful rules in order to create and execute their code. While Serena is plugging that. Beautiful teamwork, girls. So they just worked beautifully there together. They weren't arguing over the robot. They, they both felt like they were doing an important job and they pulled it off so nicely. Um, why don't I stop there for a second and see if there's any questions that I should be addressing so far. Okay. Um, the ex is this accessible with screen readers and are there tactile graphics? So the tactile graphics I can address because um, unfortunately there are not, but we are gonna get into some more of the materials and show you some of the ways that we adapted um, the materials for students who needed a more tactile experience. Um, the screen readers, um, no. So the typical applications, I'm not sure what part of the screen or what you're talking about to be accessible with screen readers, but anything that came with the robot, so any online coding interfaces or whatever, um, would do not 
are not accessible with screen readers. And that was kind of what the driving force was behind the development to begin with. Um, but we are going to show some, or I am going to show some things that are accessible with screen readers. And that's just coming up in a little bit. So if I didn't answer your question clear enough, please um, feel free to um, add a little extra in there and I'll come back to it. And one of our discussions, Leanne, we had talked about too is, our hope is to be able to partner with this wonderful group of folks and to see where we can assist as a company to assist with some of the accessibility issues that we we are, that you have concerns on. So if you have other ideas from our audience, please feel free to share and we'll take those into consideration. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And that's all part of the co-design experience, right? Yep. yep. But it's yep. such a great method. Okay, so I'll keep going and then we can we can circle back if we need to. So once that stage is set, we know that students feel much more ready to start tackling coding's increasingly complex series of skills. Um, and as long as we assume nothing and we start there, we're good. So with that in mind, we made sure that our lessons always started by telling students what they're going to learn about and then relate those concepts to things they already know about or at least take the time to build that um, background knowledge with them. So for example, what we activate their general understanding of what a robot is by doing things like reading storybooks or watching videos or playing a game with them. Or sometimes we just need to simply remind them of experiences about those coding concepts that are similar. So for example, we all know, we all understand the pains of internet access. So who is going to be able to get a better computer signal? The one right beside the modem or the one upstairs in the bedroom? Um, because that is very relatable to a very more, to a much more complex um, concept like weighted averages. Assuming nothing is also why every debugged kit starts with a lesson that explores what a robot is. We already know things about robots, so let's make sure we share those. What have we already, what do we already know about them? What have we already seen? How are they controlled? What do they do for us? We take time to examine the actual robot that we're going to be working with, note their unique characteristics, make predictions about what they're going to be able to do and how it contributes to their functionality. Not only is building and activating this background knowledge and curiosity essential for student understanding, but it also aligns really, really nicely with most basic STEM expectations in the curriculum. Additional foundation lessons also occur in all of the kits before the coding concepts are introduced, and those are dictated by each individual robot. So for example, robots that move like Dash and Cubetto and Bluebot, we need to cover directionality, forward, backward, left, and right. For Dash and Dot and Bluebot and uh, Cubelets, an understanding of the pieces of code and how they're categorized so that we can find them is a really important skill to, to uh, be able to develop as well prior to coding. With Bluebot, Bluebot is traveling around a map that has coordinates. So understanding how to identify those coordinates and, and, and locations is essential. And with Cubelets, we're actually taking pieces of the robot and putting them together to build robots. So a basic understanding of design and construction is essential for stability. We also want our students to achieve as much independence as possible. So many of our materials are supported with symbols. We use widget symbols to provide um, with all of our materials and we provide a document for our educators. So um, they have the important information that they need about how to reinforce and use those symbols to support their students understanding. So we're not supporting reading, we're supporting understanding. The symbol supported materials reinforce things like vocabulary, uh, design process, steps for problem solving, critical thinking, or even like regulation, like the example on the screen here. It's a, a tip sheet for building things together. And the symbols will just help them remember at a quick glance um, the kinds of thing, the, the kinds of things um, they need to practice as they're being a good teammate or partner. 
Our educators told us over and over and over again, too, how much more confident they saw their students were with this type of support. And they were able to do um, more self-monitoring on their own and less teacher check-ins on them um, during those independent work times. And like all good UDL things, we saw it work for more than just our target students. So multiple language learners really benefited from this type of support. Not everyone needs symbols to support them though. Many of these materials like planning blocks um, or practice activities, they'll have versions that are available with and without symbols. So educators can choose which option is best for their um, students. It's always important to us to make sure that our students are as independent as they possibly can be. So our co-designers really played a key role in helping us understand the variety of supports that we would need to include in our kits to ensure that all of them could do just that. So whenever there's a task to complete, we designed our materials um, so that everyone was doing the exact same task. So everyone, regardless of how, are doing the exact same task and then created um, created um, activities so that they would all be able to do just that. On the left side of the screen, there are a number of practice activities for a particular lesson and they're showed in a variety of different ways. So on the far left are two print activities, a level one and a level two. At the top in green is a, a sample of a clicker activity, which is screen reader accessible, but also accessible to like switches and eye gaze and joysticks. And then just below that is a text only version. So our students who require the use of screen readers are able to access that. On the right hand side of the screen is a, a few of the exact same activity for an apply section of one of our lessons. And again, the print version is on the far right hand side. You can see this one happens to be symbol supported. Just beside that at the bottom is another text only version for our students who require the use of screen readers. And this time above is a screenshot of a, a digital um, activity so that students who require touch access like on a touch screen can complete the same activity in that way. So again, all the same activity, but just in different formats. Our co-designers also reinforced for us the need for lots of different options when it came to support materials. So they inspired the creation of tip sheets, for example, that you can see on the left called We Collaborate. Um, activity instructions that are up in the middle there so that they had step-by-step -step instructions to complete particular activities and posters like the one on the right that we could hang on the classroom wall and, and keep it there for reference. And of course, on the very bottom in the middle, those are our left right bracelets, which were always a hit. Um, you can see that they are yellow and red and they have printed on them the words left and right. Yellow and red was intentionally chosen because some of our co-designers with CVI told us that those were the colors they could dif differentiate best. And then later when we co-designed with some students who were blind, inspired us to add some bra um, braille labeling to those bracelets as well. Those who do the most work, do the most learning. That's one of my favorite quotes. And that's why we want them to be as independent as possible so they can do the most learning. It's also why we also wanted to have them to have lots of choice when it came to supports so that they always have access to the things that they think work best for them. So in this particular video, I want you to watch our friend Joseph here. He utilized every resource we could throw at him. So right now, he you can see on his hands, he has the left right bracelets. They were a little too small for his wrists. So he just wore them on his hand. And he also um, really enjoyed using the reference card that had left, right, forward, and backward. You can see that in his hand. And he's using all of these supports to direct his human robot through a path that he prepared um, for her to follow. For it. Uh... So he's using the card right. to remember the name of the direction he wanted to use. Uh, and then giving her oral instructions that she's carrying out. Exactly. Counting. Okay. 
And we never taught him that. He, he figured that part out on his own, which was kind of fun. Uh, move forward two steps. He's trying to make him more efficient orally, which is really interesting. Turn left. Turn left, turn right. Independence for our students is also fostered through a thoughtful lesson construction and careful design of accessible activities. And I'm gonna show those, but I'm thinking I should probably stop for a second and just take another peek at the chat here. Um, um, so someone asked if it, um, the coding books and guides in braille and tactile format. So I'm not sure if you mean the curriculum guide, specifically when you're referring to the coding books. Um, and as um, coincidence would have it, we've already started this conversation with Leslie and Jeff and, and um, the APH gang about that. So although we don't have that in place yet, it is a consideration that we are starting to talk about and think about. Um, oh, and then Jeff has answered that. So I think I'll just leave that for now and we can circle back to that maybe at the end. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at um, some, um, some modeling and some guided practice. So as I mentioned before, before we send students off to complete any task, we made sure to embed opportunities for modeling. And that made sure that students were not facing any task um, and then floundering about what to do, right? So to show you what this might look like, um, this is Haley um, and she is with her grade one co-designers. Um, well, so her class, our co-designers, and she's going to show us how she modeled for them using one of the slide decks that we um, provided with her, um, how to determine and record coordinates um, of a particular location on BlueBot's map. So she used the slide deck to model and all the children had their um, guided practice worksheet sitting in front of them so that they and some of the um, thinking and planning materials as well so that they could follow along. Once students have that task modeled, we found that they weren't just ready, but they were actually super enthusiastic to give it a go themselves. Practice activities um, that follow the modeling are guided in some way in order to give students ample opportunity to be successful in developing their new skill in isolation. So we don't clutter it with other things going on. This is a short clip of Susie, who's again, blending the modeling and guided practice um, with her co-designers who are blind. And they are learning to navigate their tactile maps for the very first time. And I hope you're gonna hear um, that they caught on really, really quickly at the very beginning when she's, uh, she starts to misuse the language up instead of forward. You have a key and that the, each one has two letters. So I want you to put your finger on the train. Are you there, Juliet? in the bottom right corner. I want you to pretend that your finger, your index finger is the robot, and I want you to move up one square from the train and stop. Move up or forward one square and forward one more square. Up and you, should be, the same you should be on a landmark. What does the landmark say? Yeah. The initials are the initials are C H. C H. I did that. Yeah, for churches. Oh, church. Okay, it's Saint Basil. So it's a you have a key, and that the each. Sorry about that. So yes, they caught on super quick. And that's why our lesson structure is designed the way it is. Once students have built that foundation to learning by activating and building their background knowledge. 
And they're given explicit modeling and instruction that's required to get a beginning understanding of those new concepts and procedures. Then they're ready to start practicing it. And guided um, activities with hands-on practice are implemented so that they can do it themselves confidently, just like Danny here in the video that I'm going to show you. So despite a busy classroom, you didn't even look at them all yet, Tyler. Was able to still concentrate. But what about this one? Just modeled for him on his own worksheet, looking it through and getting that skill solidified before we move on to a more up, um, Is application. Is that the same as that? Is it? What is this one? All our practice activity materials are designed to support learners explicitly and intentionally. They're there um, to provide students with an opportunity to practice a newly learned concept in isolation. So before they have to generalize it in an application activity. Our co-designer educators um, also shared with us that they really loved how these uh, um, activities were able to provide them with a concrete way to informally assess their understanding of that concept so that they could give them a little bit more if they needed it. Our materials were designed and redesigned a million times under the guidance of all our co-designers. Every single activity is either going to have a variety of versions, like these level one and two samples on this screen. Remember, they're the exact same activity, except one is more supported with symbols and requires answer selection versus writing right on the page. So both uh, the left and the right samples are the same activity, but in two different versions. Or they will have supplementary pages that can be used really flexibly depending on your students' needs. So the main activity that is shown on the page um, at the top, so the colorful one on the top left and um, the more linear one on the right-hand side, they could be used just to write on directly in a typical way. And the supplementary pages that you see beside them might not be used at all, or, if you may need to use the supplementary pages, perhaps your student has difficulty with idea generation, um, or maybe you need to cut those things out so they can select them and then put them on the worksheet directly. So there's lots of different ways to use them, just like the communication cards on the bottom right. They came in handy for so much more than just communication. They were used for idea generation, for choice making, for referencing. Everything that we created was definitely used multipurpose. As coding concepts start to become more and more complex, students need more than just materials. They need strategies. So in order to do that effectively, we knew that we needed to take some of the burden off of their cognitive load as they were thinking through things. So we created things like planning blocks, arrow cards, the left-right bracelets, reference materials like you've seen already, posters and tip sheets, step-by-step -step slides that you've seen examples of, and organizational tips. They're all provided so that students can choose or be guided to choose what they need in order to be successful. Four. Yep. Correct. Sometimes when you put the air together, you don't get So that was hard. Back here. Pause that for a minute. That was Charlie. He just showed us what it looks like when confident, um, when we combine things like good strategy and good scaffolding, he was able to be independently successful. His confidence was clearly booming. And after that particular practice activity, he was certainly ready to apply his understanding to a more uh, complex problem. Same as with Lily and Serene. I want you to notice how engaged and confident they are too, as they use the them to help complete the project. And despite the noisiness of a of a busy classroom environment, they are completely engaged. This might be my favorite video series of all. There is a certain magic that a little creativity and effort can bring. 
This is our friend Brody. Brody had no formal means of communication when we met him, and he had actually just met his camp counselor there that you can see on the screen just a few days prior to us meeting him. So he and his counselor were still kind of trying to figure each other out. However, um, despite all of this being very new to her, with just a brief introduction on how to do something, she was able to work through a choice making strategy with Brody so that he could tell her what he wanted when he was doing his coding activity. So in this example, he was choosing the destination that he wanted Hubeto to travel to prior to creating his code. So I would like you to watch carefully and notice Brody using body language to communicate his choice making with her. Okay. Or, or She's presenting oh. all the different locations that he could travel to. He's really not doing anything. The Although the sand castle. Okay. <laughs> that looks like a possibility for the mountain. Recognizing the sand goes back to the sand. <laughs> okay. Lots of big body movements. So we knew that Brody wanted you better go to the sandcastle. Brody also had some significant vision issues. He could not see the robot on the table as we had originally hoped we were going to be able to provide hit, um, the robot visually to him. So knowing that his field of vision was really strongest up and to the right, um, we had a little think tank amongst us and we came up with a, um, a solution that we hoped was going to work. We connected my iPad to the, my computer. We The computer was connected to a projector. The projector was projecting onto the big screen that you can see there. And then we were using the iPad to track the movements of Cubeto. Watch again now as Brody gets to watch for the very first time Cubeto actually execute his code. Yep. Two. Okay, here we go. Again, his body movements to show his excitement as soon as he starts moving. Go forward. Okay. So turn left. There's a to the screen. See that? Okay. And then lots of big body movements to tell us how proud and excited he was once he, it was finished traveling. Being able to demonstrate understanding is often tricky for some of our students with challenges, which is why every single one of our kits comes with a dedicated section called Ensuring Active Participation, and a couple of samples are on the screen in front of you. This is a section where educators can find a comprehensive list of suggestions for interventions that can help them um, and or help them help their students overcome uh, barriers um, that might be physical, cognitive, or communicative um, in order for them to be able to participate actively in their learning. All of our solutions, including the ones with Brody, were included in this section in order to help educators get those quick uh, solutions for their students as they're going through their um, lessons and activities. We also understand that access is important when it comes to active participation, which is why all of our activity resources are offered in a variety of formats and why we also included clicker resources in our kits. This is uh, Cole in the video here and he's using his wheelchair joystick. Um, we attached the wheelchair joystick to his computer and then we brought up an act, a clicker activity for Cubeto so that he could independently plan his code with his joystick, his joystick, which he was super familiar with, using the adapted activity that we had created. And he was able to do that 100% independently once he was shown how to do it. And again, clicker activities are accessible um, by, uh, I believe, screen readers in addition to switches and joysticks and eye gaze. This is our friend Ahil on the left. You can see him using a reference sheet just in front of him to complete his coding program for dash or dot, I can't remember which one, in a typical way with a marker um, using the Blockly blocks that are provided in the kit. 
However, one of his campmates that were working alongside him um, during those sessions benefited from a more tactile uh, way to create their code. And so he used the um, cutout parameter cards um, to choose and build his choices on the right hand side image versus using a marker to write in those um, choices. This is our friend Josiah. Josiah benefited from a lot of hands-on support that all of our materials offered. In addition to physically building the block path on the floor for Dash to travel through that you can see in front of him, we used lots of visual cards um, to indicate program actions um, that we wanted that he wanted Dash to perform at each of those locations, and then also surrounded him with reference materials that he needed um, while he was thinking through his program. This is Brian, and Brian learned best when things were really, really concrete. So his teacher helped him remember those components, um, uh, the, the components that he needed in order to build a robot using cubelets. And she did that by compartmentalizing them on a cookie sheet. So you can see in the middle there, a cookie sheet with the um, cubelets on it, and they're separated by lines, and she's organized those cubelets and the three co uh, different components that they fall into. Cool um, additional fact was that those cubelets are also magnetic, so that made it a really great classroom solution for her um, because the students were able to transport them easily and then store them really easily as well. Um, Brian also needed time to process as he was thinking through his plan. So things like planning cards really help students do this without the distraction of moving parts with their robot. So they would cut out the planning cards and use the planning cards to build the robot prior to actually physically building it using um, the cubelets. And we often provide those types of cutout planning materials in all of the um, applications that um, we've built debug coding kits for. Our friend Ethan here on the left had a lot of difficulty physically accessing all of the materials that we provided. So he and his coding partner switched gears and used them instead to help him express his thinking and planning to her. And then she used them to make sure that she understood correctly what he wanted. When he was finished doing that thinking and planning orally with her, then she actually carried out the physical part of the code making for him. We didn't care that he wasn't able to actually place the block into the command, uh, um, sorry, place the command block into the control panel as long as it was what, um, as long as what she was doing was exactly what he wanted her to do. For some students, um, they might have some ability to physically access um, things, but they might require special grips in order to do so. So we also um, provide a 3D instruct the 3D instructions to 3D print specific handles, um, like the ones you can see on the left on the screen. One has a ball at the top, one has a T joint at the top. And those handles can be turned into magnetic handles, put up a magnet at the bottom of them. And then we would just add a little magnetic tape to our coding blocks or our materials that needed to be manipulated. And voila, we created instant access, sometimes pairing it with a cookie sheet in order to stabilize things. Robots are such a great motivator for learning. We saw that time and time again. And so using them to ignite learning across the curriculum isn't just great practice. It's really genius way of getting into engagement. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is our friend, Joseph. His teacher had asked the class to do some writing. And instead of getting groans, they got a lot of excitement because the story was to star dash and they were going to incorporate their new learning about loops in it. And this was Joseph's version of his written story um, at their celebration at the end of their writing. 
here we go. One day, Dash was taking driver's license. Dash gets into the car and turns the engine on. Uh, he looks both ways before going down the road. Then suddenly, Dash saw ten goats on the road blocking his way. After dodging the goats, he comes across five more animals. Dash gets an ice cream and says, that was easy. Great work. We had to shorten that video because um, Joseph's loops went on 10 times. So it was a rather long story by the time it, it finished. But the students really had a lot of fun writing those stories. Here. When we say all kids can code, we mean all kids can code. We want all students, especially our friends like Joseph and Brian, to feel respected when they learn. So when we were designing, we made sure to carefully examine every single one of our resources through an age respectful lens and made sure to tweak any of those um, experiences that might have felt a little too young so that they would be appealing to our older learners who are learning those new things as well. Sometimes that was as simple as choosing a different game or a different video that accomplished the same goal, but was, gen um, was made for an older audience. Other times though, it meant that we had to completely reframe the activity. So for example, instead of opening a fix-it shop with our littles, we hosted a hackathon with our older students. Um, instead of writing a story about our personal superpowers with our litter littles, um, we created social media posts like Instagram or TikTok um, um, entries about the skills or the things that we were particularly proud of. It really wasn't that hard in the end, to do those kinds of uh, little tweaks. And our older co-designers played a big part in helping us come up with those activities. They were more than happy to help make that happen. As you can see in these images, uh, we did hit the mark with all of it. Engagement was never a problem with these kids. All of them are showing, um, all of the images are showing our older learners working independently and collectively together. Um, and they are absolutely locked into their learning. Their feedback definitely reflected their appreciation for learning all of these new difficult concepts, but in a really fun, respectful way. And one of them even took time to thank us at the end because his previous experience learning to code was really, really quite miserable and discouraging for him. But he was super excited that he was able to take part in this project and be able to do it successfully. I'm almost finished. This is the last thing I want to share with you today. I wanted to bring your attention to another product that that government grant I mentioned early afforded us the ability to create, and we've called it Weavely. We partnered with a group from the Inclusive Design and Research Center at OCAD University here in Toronto, and their role as part of the grant was to develop a fully inclusive coding platform that would be freely available to anyone after the end of the, of the grant. So in addition to helping us with the curriculum, our co-designers also guided the development of this interface from accessibility requirements right through to the design and the actual content in Weavely. I want you to remember again, though, that three years is really not a very long time. It sounds like it, but it really isn't. And when you're programming something as sophisticated as this and you're priority is access, it really doesn't leave much time for all the other bells and whistles. So I think what you'll find if you choose to explore it is that Weavely is a really nice tool for learning beginning concepts, but unfortunately we just didn't have the time that we wanted to extend the scope as far as we had hoped. Now that said, we hope that over time, more funding dollars will come in that will allow us to continue to develop and build onto this interface as time goes on. I hope that you'll check it out. Um, you can find it 
at weavely.org, W-E-A-V-L-Y dot O-R-G. There really is a lot of really nice accessibility options built in. Um, you'll find things like keyboard shortcuts for both iOS and PC um, for navigation. Um, you'll find lots of different contrast themes, um, tons of options for um, sound and interface customizations, and lots of other um, little bells and whistles that might help reduce things like cognitive load or any physical or visual or other um, barriers that present themselves. That's all I have for today. Um, on the screen, I have um, our website, debugged.ca, D-E-B-U-G-D.ca. If you're interested in learning more about our kits, um, you can certainly visit that landing page and it will direct you accordingly. I've also put a QR code up there for those of you who might have a phone in front of you and you want to scan that really quick. And of course, my email. I am always happy um, when people reach out and want to know more about any of our kits. And I would be happy to answer any of your questions or refer you to someone else who might be able to help you better. Thank awesome. you so much, Leanne. That was fantastic. Um, very much appreciate you taking the time to share these wonderful ex examples of how to do inclusive coding with all sorts of types of students. Um, it was just wonderful. Good. I, I really appreciate being here today. Thank you so much for inviting us. Absolutely. Thank you for coming. We'll give a moment to see if there was any other questions in the chat. We try to respond to them as we came along. Um, your links are also on our um, discussion board. And also we have links, I believe, on our website as well. But um, if there are any comments or people think of things as we're moving forward, please feel free to post those in our discussion boards or in our professional learning community, as we said. And we will make sure to pass those along. And this is going to be an ongoing journey, just like most things when it comes to coding, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll just add my email in the chat here. Somebody had asked. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. There you go. All right. Well, thank you so much, Leanne. We really appreciate it again. So looking Have forward to touching base soon. So all yeah. right. Well, thank you. All right, folks, well, we're almost there. So we have one more fantastic presentation for the day. Um, our next presenter is Daniel Montour, who is going to be talking to us about chat GPT for rendering graphics. And I will, I believe we had her in here. We're running a little bit early, Daniel. Yep, I see you there, so. Hello. Hello, Daniel. how are you doing today? I'm all right, how are you? Um, it's been a great day of learning today. So yeah, no complaints. It sure has. Mm -hmm. Looks like there's been some really awesome stuff being talked about. All right. So, hi, I'm Danielle. I love that we're running early. That's so great. I feel like I've not ever had a webinar run early ever. This is fantastic. Just five minutes, but we're doing right. good. Yeah, hey, we'll you know what? I, mean? yeah. <laughs> I endeavor to remain five minutes early. <laughs> um, so, I am a technical consultant with the, uh, the Center for Assistive Tech Training in the Northwest, I'm headed up by Ting. Um, and I, with her, I do some um, art education stuff, as y'all heard about earlier with Lee and our TADA curriculum. And I do some other projects um, not related to CAT with AI and um, generating graphics and getting blind folks the ability to make their own pictures with code. Um, and you heard from Marco earlier about hand coding scalable vector graphics or SVG code. Um, what I'm doing is based on generative AI using a large language model. So what I'm going to do, kind of the outline of this, is I'm going to break down a little tiny bit of what AI is and a large language model is and the difference, um, just kind of the main differences between them. I'm going to show you that they are not all created equally, large language models, that is. I'm going to show you how I can create a picture with scalable vector graphics code. Um, just by asking a large language model to make something for me. And I'm going to show you how I can check my work. All of this is pretty straightforward. And especially toward the beginning when students don't know how to code yet or don't know the intricacies of coding, this is a really, really cool way to kind of start somewhere. Because after you create this, 
using a large language model. It's kind of a draft that you can use the skills that Marco outlines to talk about, um, to talk about editing the code with your students or the students can kind of just make some alterations and see what it does. So that's kind of the outline. Um, and so I'll just jump right in and hopefully we'll keep it five minutes early or a little bit even earlier. Um, so just at its simplest, AI is a machine's ability to have some cognition, so to speak, to kind of process and do some tasks that we generally always associated with human intelligence, which is why AI, artificial intelligence, um, we use it all the time. I have several omniscient talkie pucks who are headed up by Google and Amazon sitting across the room, trying not to say the things that will make them start beeping and talking back at me. Um, those are AI, Siri on your phone or Bigsby, is AI, um, we use it all, I mean, predictive text in essence is AI, all of that stuff, just based on its ability to kind of think ahead or try to do a few tasks. Um, large language models are a version of AI or generative AI, but are trained on massive, massive amounts of data. So Siri on an iPhone, for example, knows how you use your phone and has some other background, but it doesn't have how you know 428,000 iPhone users use their phones. Um, large language models like ChatGPT or Google's Bard or Claude AI or any of those guys are trained on like hundreds of thousands at the minimum pieces of data, just tons and tons and tons over years. Um, and that's why they have the ability to kind of have more of a memory, um, kind of back reference things, look at different, you know, you'll notice when I pull over into our other window here and start demoing, there is a cutoff, there's a data cutoff. So for GPT, it's pretty current up to April of 2023. And so, but, and that is just so much data, but it's not going online to reference anything. It just has huge amounts of data that it can access all the time without having to go and pull up a search like we would have to do to find those things because our brains do not hold that much data in that way. I mean, they kind of do, but not in the same fashion. And so what I'm going to kind of do, I'm going to share the screen. NVDA will be running. So you'll hear the audio as well. If you need me to bring it any slower, I can bring it a little bit slower, um, but everything should be bright enough and slow enough. Just let me know if not. And we're just going to kind of run through some what it can look like when we're trying to just ask two of these. So I'm going to use Bard made by Google and ChatGPT made by OpenAI to create a really simple picture just using my words and a request. I'm going to show you that not all instructions are written equally and that not all instructions are taken correctly in, you know, in the same ways by each of these large language models. All right. And we're going to do this. All right. Share content window. So now you should be hearing NVDA. And I will come over to this window over here. I'm going to maximize it. All right. So. We have here two tabs. We have Bard and we have ChatGPT. Right now I'm in Bard. So I'm kind of just looking around just to kind of give you an idea of what's on the screen. If there are any blind folks in the room, there are example prompts that I can click. There is a text box in which I can enter a prompt right here. All right. So what it told me at the beginning, and I want to flag this for folks, Bard gave me this earlier and I dismissed the pop-up, but what it said was that it, it was asking for location data. And if it wanted, you know, if I wanted it to be able to use precise location data, I said I did not, but this is really, really important. And I'm going to kind of keep touching on this a little bit as we go, that this stuff, if you are working with a student who is under 18, please have someone with them or ha A, have them be very aware that they need to be able to kind of be aware of these privacy things and not just immediately hit okay really read these things be cautious about them and have someone there when a student is under 18 um, working on this in a school setting um, and just be aware of what data is collected so i made sure that my precise location was not collected 
and we're going to keep no, going. So I'm going to ask it. I'm going to actually mute my mic while I type because you will hear it in high fi if I do not. And you'll see, I'll go over what I type in just a second. No text edit fields. No pre input for prompt text edit multi-line enter a prompt here. P-L-E-A-S-E space E-R-E-A-T-E space A-A-S-P-G space E-O-D-E space R-E-P-R-E-S-E-N-T-I-F-G space A space D-L-A-C-K space E-A-T space A-T-E space A-T-E space E-A double S. Okay, so I just put in the text box. Please create spelling error SVG code representing. Please create SVG code representing. Please create spelling error SVG code representing a black cat with white paws. A black cat with white paws. Super, super simple. So I'm just kind of giving it something to go off of here. I'm going to hit enter and let it generate. So it told me that Bard was typing. It'll tell you that with JAWS or NVDA when you hit enter on that box. Um, so it lets you know when Bard is generating and what it's done. I'm going to hit this. So I'm going to go back up to the previous graphic because that's the easiest way to kind of jump around and see what Bard or ChatGPT is giving you unless you hold down the shift key too long like I just did. All right. Sure, here's the SVG code representing a black cat with white paws. So it just says, sure, here's SVG code. Code snippet. And let's see. Let's SVG with equals 200, high equals 200, new box equals 00, 100, 100, XML, okay. HTTP, slash, slash, W, 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 dot, W, three, dollar, slash. So at the first, I'm just looking at it. And I'm realizing, so I told it to create an SVG image. And I saw that it did a 200 by 200 length by width. Earlier, Marco may have talked about there being kind of pixels. So two by two or 200 by 200 is basically two by two. That is tiny, tiny, tiny. And it, it could be kind of difficult if I wanted to print this out on a tactile or if I wanted to emboss this on a graphics embosser. That is in really small size. And it will probably be a little bit too small for students to fully pick out details. I didn't tell it to make it any bigger because I didn't tell it what I, you know, I didn't tell it what the application for this was or anything. I just kind of told it, make cat. And so it did. And we, and we kind of just see it made um, a black fill. So it kind of tell, it tells you all this. I could come down here and hit copy code. And it would just copy all of this code to the clipboard. And then I will I will come back to this later. But this basically shows like this, if I copy this here, I can go paste it somewhere else and we will see a picture. But I'm gonna stop right here on Bard for now. I will say this isn't always created equally. So earlier I told Bard that I wanted to give it some specifications for SVG code to create. And if it didn't know something, to ask for clarification before I continued. That's about what I'm going to tell ChatGPT right now. Bard was very confident, said it could do it, and then proceeded to give me Python. So it isn't always the best at following instructions. Um, and we might be able to have Bard embarrass itself later, but that was what it did earlier, and it was pretty great. It was not able to be put in an SVG in the way that I was hoping for. And it literally said right below it, here's some Python code. Well, thanks, but right above it, I just asked you for SVG. So there's that. Chat We're going to come over here to ChatGPT. And ChatGPT has kind of a similar setup. There's a box for prompting. There are these little text prompt examples right above. Recommend a dish. Recommend a dish. To impress a date who is a picky eater. Okay. Now it says right here, and this is important. I'm going back just a little tiny bit to what I said earlier. ChatGPT makes mistakes is giving you a disclaimer here. Because even though these guys have tons and tons and tons of data, one of the things we really want to focus on is trust but verify that something is correct. So it's kind of telling you the same thing here. And ChatGPT in particular is really good about giving disclaimers for this type of stuff and really puts some importance on making sure people realize that this is not the end all be all of the information that you can get or that shouldn't be given to you for something. So I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna again mute so you don't hear high five key clicks, but I'm basically gonna give it, I'm gonna tell it what I'm gonna do and just prepare it. I'm gonna tell it that I'm gonna give it some criteria for creating SVG representation of an image and that if it has any questions, please ask. And then kind of go, and what I do with ChatGPT is I ask it if it has any clarification questions before we start. That way I allow it to give me as little assumption as possible, because if it needs something clarified, it will generally ask. 
I'm just going to make it super quick so you don't hear all of these hi-fi key clicks. And I'm going to give that prompt. And the prompt, just kind of to go over that super briefly, is an instruction given to this large language model, just written word to ask it to process some things for me. Question. Okay, and just to go over what I wrote. Would like you to create, I'm going to give you some specifics about the spelling error SVG representation of an image I. Would like you to create, please ask for clarification if you don't know something. Do you have any questions before I continue? All right, I'm going to now hit enter and see what it says. And just if anyone is a screen reader user in here or is working with students who are, the easiest way to just send this off is with control enter, because enter will actually make a line break. You can do, you can kind of separate things out into paragraphs and lines in this box. So I do control enter just to send it. I'd be happy to assist you in creating an SVG representation of an image. Please go ahead and provide the specifics you have in mind, and I'll do my best to help. If I have any questions or need clarification along the way, I'll be sure to ask. Okay, so just to kind of go over it, in, um, it briefly just kind of said, it will ask if it has any questions. It will do its best to create an SVG representation for me. Message chat GPT so multi-line. what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a little bit more of a quality instruction than I gave Bard. I'm going to tell chat GPT to create an 800 by 1000 pixel canvas to use. And that's basically an eight by 10 inch paper. Um, that way there's some room on an eight and a half by 11 if you emboss this on letter sized braille paper. Um, and so that way I'll just kind of tell it, what I'm gonna tell it to do is make a black cat with white paws, green eyes, and a long fluffy tail. I'm just gonna mute again so you're not hearing it, but that is what I'm gonna tell it. And I will show you exactly what I write in just a second. Okay. Please create spelling error SVG code of black cat with white paws, green eyes, and long fluffy. Tail, please use a canvas of 800 by 1000 pixels. All right. So I just put in exactly what I said I was going to type in just now. We're going to hit control enter and it's going to generate something. And now we can kind of see. Chat GPT graphic. Chat GPT. Creating a detailed SVG representation of a black cat with white paws, green eyes, and a long, fluffy tail can be quite intricate. I will provide a simplified version to get you started, but please note that creating a highly detailed and realistic SVG image may require more complex and precise vector graphics tools. Here's a basic SVG representation of a black cat, XML. Okay. So it kind of gives me a disclaimer. It's kind of, it was just finishing up generating, but it gives me this disclaimer that it's going to give me a simplified version of this, of an image that I'm asking for. And the kind of the important part earlier that I was mentioning is this is a really cool drafting tool. This isn't necessarily the end all be all of doing an SVG representation of an image, but it gets you started. And so this might be a little simpler than what we might want ultimately, but it gets us started somewhere if we don't know where to start. And that's something that personally has helped me as I've been learning SVG. Um, Marco is incredible and does hand-coded SVG from the start and is just absolutely, like, I just look up at that and I'm just like, that is just amazing. And I cannot do it. Most blind folks I know are in a similar situation and so this is really kind of a cool way to just use words to get started with something. So now there's a button that says copy code. I can just, just like with Bard, Bard had a little copy code block button as well. I can copy the code that it's generated for me and I can put it somewhere. XML, precise vector graphics tools. Here's a basic and that's what I'm going to do. Great copy code button. So I'm going to hit button copy. this to copy the code. I'm going to open up. So now what I'm going to do is I have this SVG code. And I want to show an actual picture. And so what I'm going to do. No next graphic. 
is I'm going to open up a notepad window. All right. I use notepad plus plus because I like being able to turn on my line numbers that will. Um, I don't always need them, but when I want it, I want it. And so I use notepad plus plus just because it's a little easier. Text edit for Mac. All right. We're going to paste that code here. All right. So now we have this pretty many lines of SVG code. What I'm going to do is I'm going to save this as an SVG file directly from Notepad. I can change it back to text if I want to look at this code just as it is right here in this window that I forgot to maximize. There we go. All right. So I can change, so I can either save it as text right here and just keep this straight up code, which is fine. It will work and it will allow me to make alterations if I want to later. Or I can save it directly as an SVG file, and that's what I'm going to do. Save I'm going to hit Control S to save. Auto completion not Come over here. Level two C. Collect D. Level zero desktop. One drive. Expand one to one. D. Level one L. Personal. D. Level two desktop. One drive. Collapse one to three. D. Documents. One to D. Level one start of quick access. Desktop. Pin. All right. I'm going to check desktop. Items, names, click button, collect, I'm going to come over here. Box, collapse, help, save aside, combo, file, file. Now I'm going to name it GPT Testcat. E E S T C A T. All right, and now. Instead of just hitting enter here, because I've typed in this, I've typed in the name of the file, I have not yet changed the extension of the file. So I'm going to sit right here, and instead of just hitting enter, I'm going to do dot .svg. So I'm changing it into a scalable, a vector graphics file. All right. And now it's saved. So we're going to get out of here. I'm going to come to my desktop. I have two cats. We'll see which one's better. Just come over here and open this in Chrome. Or lose my focus in one or the other. All right. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to render this in Chrome. Maximize it. Okay. So now we have an image that ChatGPT has made. As a blind person, I don't yet know if it's any good. So what I can do from here is I can again use a large language model capability to figure this out. I have two ways to do it. And I'll show you them both super quickly. So one, I'm using NVDA and I can actually use an NVDA add-on to do this. So I'm going to show you that. And then I'm going to show you Be My AI, which is through the Be My Eyes app, which is available to anybody using iOS and is now on a closed beta list for Android. So it is coming to Android devices pretty soon. I'm going to do a shortcut here Context menu. that's going to bring up, Entire screen, current focus I can either describe what's on the current focus, navigator object, then. navigator object, which is kind of NVDA cursor stuff, entire or the entire screen. I'm going to do current focus and let's see what it gives us. Retrieving. Description. It's retrieving. The image shows a screenshot of a video conference call. On the top right, we can see four video titles. Three of which show the names and affiliations of participants, and one showing a participant with the name Danielle Monster. She slash A. Below their image, the titles are labeled Leslie Wild Walker, Outreach, Jeff Schwartz with a small red pen icon, and Stephanie Walker with a microphone icon next to the pen icon, suggesting that Jeff Schwartz is currently in control of the screen and Stephanie Walker is muted. In the center left of the image, there is a large black oval shape with a scraggly edge at the bottom, which covers a majority of the screen. This shape has two green dots and a smaller pink dot arranged in a classic face configuration, reminiscent of a simple cartoon character or an emoticon. The shape appears to be a playful or whimsical addition, either intentionally placed there for humor or creativity, or possibly a digital artifact or placeholder representing a user without a video feed. There are several interface elements at the top of the screen indicating features such as closed captioning, record blank, blank. So, NBDA. sometimes. Chat GPT, GPT test cat speech document. It describes the zoom window instead of the window that I actually wanted to. Restore, move so, unavailable size unavailable list, minimize end, maximize unavailable list. Document. Land. We're gonna try doing. I'm actually gonna relaunch it and try. So what it did though, which is cool, is it did describe all of the zoom window that it could see in the background. So this is kind of cool in that a student can very easily tell when it goes wrong. And I'm glad that this did kind of go a little bit sideways because I selected the wrong thing for it to describe by accident. But if that happens to a student, it's really easy to tell when that goes wrong. Um, and honestly, a lot of the time, this is gonna be a little bit less common to use, um, the NVDA add-on, but that just described really well a bunch of really cool stuff. Like I didn't know how it showed icons of how when people were in control of screens. I learned that right now, just right now. Um, and so stuff like that, it gives you useful information. And that is the style in which it will describe things. I'm actually going to try relaunching it just to make Hold sure that it's fully maximized. Hold All right. 
Share export delete deal. Pop up window. Open no enter one of thirteen. Open with collapse paste. Pop up Google Chrome two five. Folder view list. G G P T S cat dot S B G Google Chrome. All right. System menu. I'm gonna maximize here. Okay. And now we're gonna try that again one more time here, and then I'm gonna show you what it would be like with Be My AI. Context menu. Current focus C. Navigate entire screen. You know what? We're gonna do the entire screen. See what it tells us. Description. This can also tell you if a window is really, really, truly maximized or not. You are looking at a computer screen display in the video conferencing platform interface. Zoom, which appears to be so Zoom will always overlay. That is the fun thing I am learning because it is describing Zoom instead of describing the video that I have or the picture that I have up. So this is really cool, right? Because even though I wanted it to describe the cat, it's instead describing what is most prominent on the screen, which is something that as students begin to learn how to code is really, really important for them to understand what like a graphical user interface looks like, what controls look like. So yes, this is tangential. Yes, this is not exactly describing what I hoped it would, and it's still educational. And I wanna just kind of point out that even when this goes a little sideways, it still gives really good information and allows students to experiment with different things to try to get it to describe different aspects of a screen or a window. PM. So I'm going to actually pull open Be My AI. I will make sure that you aren't being graced with all the lovely, lovely audio of my voiceover. All right. So I'm pulling up the Be My Eyes app. I'm gonna open, I'm gonna raise my volume of my voiceover and slow it down. Please let me know if I need to any more than I am going to. Take a volume. 95%. All right. Tab bar. Take 55%. So now I've opened up this Be My Eyes app. Selected. Be my AI. And there is a tab on here on the bottom called Be My AI. This is free. Um, I know some schools have some permissions things, so it may need to be bypassed through them if needed, but this is visual interpreting. So just kind of putting that out there, that this app also includes the ability to call visual interpreters. And so they're just, again, privacy, making sure you're there with folks who are under 18, making sure that there is some security of information here. Let's so take picture. I'm going to come over to this take picture button. Yeah. I'm going to try again just to make System sure menu. that my screen is managed Restore or is maximized. Unavailable. Size unavailable. Maximize unavailable list. All right. So it does say unavailable, which means it already is maximized. Document. Yeah. What I don't know at this point actually is how well it will describe the image on the screen instead of the Zoom platform. I'm going to learn that right now using Be My AI. So I'm lining up my camera with my screen. Take picture button. And I'm just going to hit this take picture button and we're going to see what it says. Take picture. Analyzing picture. Please wait. The picture shows a laptop screen with an open Zoom meeting. On the left side of the screen, there is a white background with a cursor in the middle. On the top left corner, there is a small notification that says recording on. Copy description. On the right side of the screen, there are three Zoom participant windows. The top window shows a person. At the bottom of the screen, there is a taskbar with various icons, including Google Take Picture. Okay, so what we've learned is, A, how the Zoom screens are set up. B, that I'm apparently going to have to stop screen sharing to actually get a picture of this cat that will actually uh, be able to be recognized in any sort of way. <laughs> it's because it's it's laying out all of the different things that it show that it sees on the screen in an order that makes sense. So like it talks about kind of the split screen of how a Zoom call is set up. And as you heard, as you may have heard, it mentioned that there was a taskbar with icons on the bottom. So it's again kind of familiarizing you with where things are graphically, visually on a screen. I'm going to stop screen sharing for a minute to kind of see if we can't get a picture of this cat because I want y'all to see the description that it gives for this. Because um, what's really cool about it is it kind of, you can ask it a bunch of questions 
Actually, you know what? Why don't we just ask it some questions about what we have right here? From Alicate, everyone mentioned what is the NVDA add-on and alert. The NVDA add-on is the AI content describer. Um, it is under the stable channel of the NVDA add-ons category. At the bottom of the screen, there is a taskbar with various icons, including Google Chrome, File Explorer, and Zoom. The time in the bottom right corner of the screen is 3.33 p.m. and the date is 12 slash 4 slash 2023. The laptop has a black keyboard with function keys at the top. Okay. I'm going to ask it if it can right side, see anything involving a Google Chrome window, just to see what it tells me. And if it can tell me what, if there's, if there is anything, ask more. what part of the screen it might be on. I'm going to dictate it just so you can hear how I ask the question. Do you see anything involving a Chrome window anywhere on the screen? Question mark. If so, comma, where is it? Question mark. Inserted. Do you see anything involving a Chrome window anywhere on the screen? If so, where is it? Call a volunteer. Add picture. Clear text. So I could call a volunteer. Send message. Button. Okay. Send, send please message wait. here. Be my AI is writing a message. Be my AI. Yes, there is a Chrome window icon on the taskbar at the bottom of the screen. It is located among other icons such as File Explorer and Zoom. Additionally, there is another Chrome icon next to it. The taskbar is just above the laptop's keyboard. Okay, so there's some things to unpack there. Without knowing your directions, I wouldn't necessarily know that there's a cat. The picture shows a large black circle with two much smaller green circles for eyes and one small pink circle for a nose. Alert. And I'll actually show you. Um, number one, uh, just kind of answering these live. One, um, you're absolutely correct that this is, it, <laughs> um, I looked very briefly at the SVG code, and this is actually very different from the cat I got earlier. I'm going to show you both cats. Um, and so this one might be kind of more like a cat face cartoon. The one I made earlier using the same exact prompting gave me a different result. And I'm going to pull that up in just a second as well. Um, Picture Smart, I saw a question about Picture Smart, um, is not hooked up with GPT-4 the way that the add-on I have for NVDA is, but it does use some basic AI stuff to try to describe images. I would not be surprised if down the road, it was also using AI to try to describe images and building that right into the screen reader. That would not surprise me in the slightest. Um, so that's kind of where I see that going. Um, so I'm going to actually bring up, I'm going to put this down for just a second, and I'm going to bring up this other cat that I made with the exact same, you saw the words I wrote earlier. I used the same exact words and I got a completely different cat. Um, and that just to kind of give you a quick vocabulary term in, in case you hear it is the temperature that talks about the temperature of an AI being used. So the higher that temperature number, the more varied your responses are going to be. And so we can tell with this that it's a little bit higher than what Be My AI is because Be My AI, if I take that picture of this screen several times, will give me the same exact description every single time without fail. That means the temperature is pretty much at zero. So it's going to give you one thing and not take any risks and it's going to stay there. So it is a little bit more of a stable, a little bit more play it safe application of this large language model, which is why I really like the idea of using it in education because it plays safe. There are those safeguards up as there is with anything on GPT relating to offensive content. And it really, really tries hard to kind of play by the rules, play it safe and kind of play a little bit less risky than other AI models might. So I'm going to come over here all the way to the top. And I'm going to open up test cat one, which is what I wrote or what I did earlier. Folder view list, GPT, start value 36 of top kitchen sink 30. Test cat one three thirty eight. This function. Danielle, this is Jeff. Yeah. Um, this, there was a couple of questions in the chat that before you move on might be worth um, mentioning. Um, someone asked the question of what is the NVDA add-on that you mm -hmm. were using called? Oh, it is the AI content describer. And it's under the stable channel of the NVDA add-ons library or add-on oh. store. Thank you. Um, another question that was thrown in the chat was, how would the JAWS picture smart feature work with this? So kind of just to rehash, um, JAWS doesn't necessarily have the AI integration that that add-on I showed you does at this point. I will not be surprised if that comes out 
in a pretty near future. Right now, it's kind of using a much more basic description, kind of a little bit of a um, computer vision, um, a little bit of AI there, not as detailed in any way as the GPT-4 stuff is just yet. Um, it does have the, you know, it does want to describe images and does so kind of in a basic way, but is not here yet. Microsoft has Google Chrome Google 5. There was one other comment that was in the chat. Um, it said, without knowing your directions, I wouldn't necessarily know that it is a cat. The picture shows a large black circle with two small green circles for eyes and one small pink circle for a nose. And that's actually why I'm opening up this one right here, this new one, because I use, and I was kind of talking a little bit about this, that like the same prompt can get you very different results sometimes, which is why trust but verify is so important. Um, you'll notice when you use Dolly, which is um, a GPT-4 application to actually just create images, not even code for images, but just images, it will give you several different variations just to kind of see which one you like better. So there was that kind of weird circular dot cat face. And then there's this. Folder view list. Test cat one three thirty eight. Land. System menu. X. Okay. Land. So that is a much different cat. And I got a description earlier of this that mentioned it being kind of a cartoon cat. Um, so it looks a lot different from the circles and dots that I was kind of seeing in the code earlier. I could stop screen share to pull a description of this super quickly, um, because basically, if I take a picture now, it's probably going to just really favor that zoom window, because we really seem to enjoy having zoom in the background. And I just saw the comment in the chat that this one looks much more like a cat than the previous one. Exactly. And it's so weird because I gave it the same exact instructions, but that is kind of the cool thing. Interesting, cool, weird, depending on the time that you're using it and how cooperative it is to what you wanted of this type of stuff. So on one hand, it isn't as precise as knowing exactly what you're going to hand code in SVG. On the other, if you don't know where to start, and you kind of know that you want a cat, but you don't really know where to start with it, you could get several ideas here. You could also regenerate. So I could go over into that window and um, into the chat GPT window and regenerate my prompt there and get a completely different result. And so earlier, cat with kind of circles and dots and not really looking super cat-like, same, as, same exact instruction earlier that I put in, it has this, which is more of a cartoon cat that looks at the viewer. Um, is what AI, what Be My AI was telling me earlier. And I was able to kind of ask it, did it have green eyes? I was able to check. So these are the types of things that we can encourage students to do um, when they are not screen sharing on a Zoom conference, because apparently then we just get Zoom all the time. But if they are not, which most of them won't be, this is a really kind of a cool way to show this up. The other thing is from here, right here, what I can do is if I have a Pix Blaster, um, I can do a Control P right here, Test button. and I don't even have to scale this anything or any differently because I did that 800 by 10, by 1,000 pixel canvas, which is an eight by 10. I could just print it just as it is right here. I could select the Pix Blaster and go. It would be that simple. And so this is a really cool way if you want to be able to use a tactile graphics embosser to be able to put this onto hard copy or for a student to check what they were doing, they could absolutely do that using just a quick drafting process of a piece of braille paper and just seeing if they like how it feels or not. Because there's one thing with getting, you know, checking your work with AI, which is awesome and can give you some cool ideas. You can also ask a sighted person, but a really cool way for these folks to check their work. And we've seen this all day right? We've seen this in different presentations. It's really, really important to be able to self-validate what you're doing. And this is the way you can do that tactily. Um, down the road, I'm sure we'll be using dot arrays like the Monarch instead of brailing out on an embosser necessarily, but both options will be available. And the Pix Blaster and View Plus tactile embosser or graphics embossers can process SVG stuff. So from here, I can do that. It does not work on things like the Page Blaster um, for a few reasons. One, I have some color in here, and so there's multiple oh, dot heights. And so those multiple dot heights make it so that this is a lot easier on a Pix Blaster that allows you to have technically eight heights, blank space, and seven different dot heights. And so that's kind of the idea.
in terms of why we want it to be on there and that it processes kind of some of these image types to show you basic representations. Um, that was a lot of info. Um, <laughs> and I would love to give time for anyone to ask any questions or, you know, have me go into any specific things about giving more instructions to either Bard or Chat GPT or anything that's come up while I've been kind of walking around showing these images. ChatGPT from Gino Fugate to everyone. Fantastic presentation. My students were leaving, but were very enthusiastic. Alert. ChatGPT. Mozilla Firefox. ChatGPT. Mozilla. I'm really, really happy to hear that the students were enjoying it. Have you tried using Claude? Alert. I have tried using Claude. Um, I do enjoy Claude, and Claude is really good at doing some fun image analysis. Um, I didn't do that here just because I already had these two windows open. Claude is really cool. And for folks who haven't used Claude, Claude is trained is another large language model, so has all of those to everyone, monarch, HTTP, tons slash, and slash. tons and tons of data, just as these guys do, but it's in an anthropological framework. So it's a lot more kind of centered on um, human science and art and those types of things in a little bit of a different way than BARD or ChatGPT are. From to everyone, what is the difference between using ChatGPT versus BARD? Alert. So the difference between using ChatGPT and BARD really comes down to what you like. So a while back, I was asking BARD to create a geographic, or ge wow, words, very sorry, geometric shapes res representation of a dog. And I told it that I wanted, I was just doing random dot heights so that I could test it out. And so I was telling it to do red ears and a tail. I think I told it to do a green tail. It was weird. I don't know. I, it was just random colors that I pulled out. And it forgot the ears the second time through that I did this. I was like, okay, so I see a head and eyes and a nose and I don't see ears. I specifically asked you for ears. What happened? And then it kind of was like, and this, you'll see this sometimes and feel free to call these AIs out on their stuff because they will absolutely with full confidence sometimes go full bore with the wrong answer. Um, I actually had an AI tell me that there was a subway line X in New York City. And if I were to have gone and done that, I, or if I'd been looking for that subway line X, it would not have gone well. All right, that should be gone and you should also not hear NVDA anymore. Okay, um, and so it really is just the quality of, uh, it's the quality of what you get. And sometimes one does better than the other. And I love that we can use both. Um, so you do need an account for both of them. In terms of schooling, um, a lot of folks already have Gmail or have Google accounts set up and a Google ecosystem set up. And so it would actually be a lot easier, I think, for some folks to use BARD in that way. Um, but they're both pretty straightforward and will give you different qualities of content. Um, and you'll just kind of see that the tones of their responses are a little different. So BARD will kind of say like, sure, I'm ready, we can do it. And GPT is a lot more full of disclaimers and will be like, I will try my best. Just know that you might need more stuff is really, really kind of dead set on letting you know that it is one of many tools and not just the only tool. Jeff, did I miss any questions while I was answering this in the chat? Um, did you get the, I'm sorry, cause I kind of got distracted. Can you, uh, what well, the last question was, can you take the code from one of these and put it into blind SVG as a starting point? Um, not at this time. Blind SVG is a lot more about resources and how to hand code your own SVG. Um, so you can use what you learn in alert or at blindsvg.com to make alterations to the code that you get. So I could switch that SVG file back to a txt file by renaming it and just putting .txt instead, just the same way I did when I was saving it from that notepad window. And you can kind of learn how to make alterations. You could also... Is 
that that's a good point i'm going to address that in just a second actually because that's that's an excellent point and something that really makes bard very helpful um so i i think that you would just go and use blind svg as a way to learn how to make the alterations you want you could also put it back into either chat gpt or bard and ask it to make changes for you um you can also upload the file with chat gpt and it's code interpreting or or sorry it's file analysis or use the code interpreting tools that it has to offer um a really good point about bard being able to kind of learn what you like because it's already attached to your google account um so using like if it knows that you like python it will kind of start going more toward python unless you ask it to do something different specifically and so that can be really cool to kind of go with what the student has already been researching if they've been doing things on papers that sort of deal that can be a plus or a minus depending on kind of what you're looking for so just kind of putting that out there all of these are really fantastic tools just being aware that they do for better or worse have good memory Well, that that is really, really fun. And now I I, uh, I want to experiment with this some myself. Uh, but I'm, I'm just kind of curious, do you need to say please or are we modeling um, good request behavior for some <laughs> Absolutely just modeling good behavior. <laughs> I, I was on the side of the apes during Planet when I watched Planet of the Apes as a kid. And I definitely am like, you know what? I'm just gonna talk nice. Doesn't matter, right? <laughs> awesome. I don't see anything else in the oh, chat. Hey, I did it. I've you made us did. early still. Excellent. I think people prefer to end a little early than uh, to end a little late. I also do. Thank you all so, so much for having me and for letting me close out your first day. I really, really appreciate it. I know it gets a little tough to sit still by the end of the day. So thank you. Thank you, Danielle. You definitely kept our attention and um, it was great to have you ending our day. So, and we will do our best to wrap up very quickly now because I'm sure no one minds getting a little half hour of their life back. So um, just some closing remarks that I'd like to share as we're wrapping up. Um, one thing I would like to mention is that we have a student competition opportunity, or uh, let me phrase it correctly, we have it a student award opportunity. So the National Coding Symposium this year is excited to partner with Humanware, Vispero, and the American Printing House for the Blind to offer students awards as part of this year's symposium. The Sparrow will be giving two credits of $3,000 each towards the purchase of technology from any of their brands. Humanware will also be giving a Braille Note Touch Plus and a robotics kit, which they will be demonstrating later on in the symposium this week. And we will also have um, opportunity from the American Printing House. We will be providing either a low vision or tactile device of a choice. We'll be working to make sure we're fitting the right product with the right type of learner. A product specialist from Either our organization or one of our supporting organizations will connect with a reward recipients and their TVIs to help choose the most appropriate device that may help them in their journey with coding. I'm going to go ahead and drop the link. It is can be found, the application link can be found on the Coding Symposium page, but I'm going to go ahead and drop the direct link in here so to make it easy for anyone. So if you are a teacher or have students that you are working with or know of folks that are looking to move forward with their uh, learning with coding, um, I encourage you to take a look at this application and it's a, an essay competition and I think there's great opportunity here to um, be able to get some really fantastic rewards for your efforts. Um, also, as a reminder, if you haven't already done so, the coding symposium is three days this week, this year. So tomorrow and Wednesday, we have additional programming scheduled. Tomorrow's theme is actually coding towards careers. So we started our journey today with focus on student and learning. And tomorrow we'll be looking at how we take coding, whether it's a hobby or a skill set that we're learning in school and what direction we would go to make careers out of that. And I'm going to go ahead and also um, drop the links for both of the tomorrow and Wednesday's webinars. 
into the chat to make it easy for folks. If you haven't had an opportunity to already register, if you must register for each state um, separately. So um, anyway, I would like to thank all of our presenters for today for a wonderful day of learning. Um, I'd also like to, at this time, pause our recording.